Welcome to this course, Aggregation for Data Scientists. I'm Nathan, and it's my pleasure to be one of your instructors for this course. This course is part of our specialization, MongoDB Analytics, which has been designed to provide you with a broader understanding of how to fully utilize MongoDB from a data science and analytics perspective. In this course, you will learn how to leverage MongoDB's powerful aggregation framework to shape and ask questions of your data. You will also learn the basics of how to handle that data once transformed by converting into a data frame and use basic machine learning models to make predictions. These topics will be introduced and explained in stages. First, you'll be gradually introduced to the aggregation framework and how to perform shaping and analysis operations. Once you have a solid grasp of the aggregation framework, we'll be looking into several different data sets and using the popular Python machine learning library, Scikit-Learn, to train models and make predictions. This course is for both recent additions to the MongoDB family that would like to learn about data science and machine learning, and for experienced data science practitioners who would like to understand how to leverage the power of MongoDB to improve their workflows. Finally, I just want to welcome you again to the second course on MongoDB. We hope that you enjoy the material that we've prepared for you. We wish you the best of luck. In this video, we'll discuss the necessary prerequisites you should have before taking this course, what the coursework is going to look like, and finally, we'll discuss what software is necessary to complete the coursework. Let's begin with the prerequisites. Before beginning, it is expected that you have a basic knowledge of MongoDB and you're familiar with Python the language of choice throughout this specialization. Specific knowledge of the libraries used later in the course is not required as we will provide the basics for understanding, though we will not delve too deeply into the art and science of tuning hyperparameters during the machine learning portion. Next, let's talk about the work you'll be doing. Throughout this course, you're going to be watching lesson videos that explain different MongoDB and data science topics. Many of these lessons will be followed by an ungraded quiz to test your understanding of the content in the lesson video. Additionally, you'll be asked to perform practical exercises via downloadable Jupyter Notebooks. These will be graded exercises that count towards your grade in the course. Finally, let's discuss the necessary software you'll need to complete those graded notebook exercises. We'll be using Python 3 for our Jupyter Notebooks and for the course. We recommend that you install Python 3 and Jupyter via Anaconda. Moreover, Anaconda makes it very easy to have separate Python environments. This will come in handy as you install different Python libraries via pip. Throughout this course, we'll be using MongoDB Atlas, the easiest way to run MongoDB in the cloud for many of the lesson exercises. Sometimes you'll be connecting directly to our own Atlas cluster, and other times you'll be connecting to your Atlas cluster. To that end, you'll need to make sure you can connect to Atlas, so make sure there are no firewalls or network restrictions preventing you from doing so. Additionally, you'll need to create a MongoDB Atlas cluster. If that sounded like a lot, have no fear. We have lessons to walk you through all of this. And those are the logistics for the course. Best of luck. In this lesson, we will learn what the MongoDB aggregation framework is at a high level and see examples that demonstrate some of the power the framework provides. We'll also discuss why you should learn the MongoDB aggregation framework, how and where MongoDB's query language and CRUD operations in the aggregation framework are related and where they differ, and why we use aggregation in this course. So, what is the MongoDB aggregation framework? If we were to come up with a custom definition of MongoDB's aggregation framework, it might read something like, the aggregation framework is a framework that allows the developer to express functional pipelines that perform preparation, shaping, and analysis of data. This is accomplished through the use of stages, which perform a specific action like grouping, sorting, shaping, and more, along with using expressions the functional units of logic in the aggregation framework. You'll learn about the myriad stages and expressions available throughout the course. We will now look at some examples showing different aggregations. We're not going to elaborate the details of the specific stages or expressions used in these examples, but rather give an overview of the power of the aggregation framework. First, Let's look at how we would find the average age for customers with an account type of gold given 
the following simple schema, where we have a name, account type, and age field. Looking at it, we can see that the two entries within an account type of gold have ages 33 and 28, so average to 30.5. Here is the aggregation that expresses this. However, aside from analysis, we also said preparation and shaping. Later in the course, we will work with the Titanic data set, a famous data set people use to develop models to try to predict survival. Here is a sample document to show the schema and data types. Performing some data exploration, we might want to ask the question, among survivors, which surname had the highest survival count? And this simple aggregation expresses what we want. It's succinct, powerful, and able to work with data without a lot of pre-processing. We will also see how we can turn a tree that looks like this with only leaf nodes into a tree that looks like this, and ultimately into a tree that looks like this, entirely within the aggregation framework. That covers what the MongoDB aggregation framework is at a high level. Remember, the examples you saw are only a small sample of the massive power that lies hidden within the aggregation framework. So, let's discuss why you should learn aggregation. First and foremost, mastering the aggregation framework will allow you to perform powerful transformations and ask complex questions of your data at the database layer, typically resulting in faster answers with less bandwidth use. It also allows us to more easily work with big data because we can shape and slice it. Let's look at how the MongoDB query framework for CRUD operations and the aggregation framework relate and where they differ. They both allow for querying collections and basic shaping of the results. The aggregation framework also allows for powerful data derivation, analysis, and advanced shaping operations. One caveat, with the dollar out stage, the aggregation framework can technically create as well, and we'll cover that later on in the course. So, why do we use aggregation in the course? The reasons we use aggregation in this course are simple. Much work in data science involves preparing data by either cleaning or deriving new information and asking questions of it. This is best accomplished within aggregation. Okay, let's summarize what we've discussed. We have learned that the aggregation framework provides a framework for preparation, shaping, and analysis. We've also discussed why you should learn the aggregation framework, where aggregation is similar and different to the MongoDB query framework, and why we use aggregation in this course. Best of luck. Pipelines. You'll hear us mention pipelines quite a bit throughout the course, so let's take a few minutes to discuss what they are. Pipelines can be thought of as a conveyor belt in a factory. Along the line, there are different assembly stations. These assembly stations are stages. Depending on what we want to accomplish, we may have only one stage or we may have many stages. Pipelines work like this. Documents represented by these squares enter our pipeline and begin to flow into our first stage. This stage is called match, which you'll be introduced to very soon. We set this stage up so that only red and blue squares make it through. Next, they flow through our pipeline and enter the second stage. In this example, we'll call this stage project. We set this stage up to transform our squares into circles. This is a small representation of the power the aggregation framework offers. We can transform our data in almost any way we desire. We'll be covering the project stage in great detail in later lessons. This stage represents one of the many powerful analysis stages available, and it is called group. Here, we have configured the stage to gather all of the documents that are flowing into it and produce a single document that gives us the ratio of red to blue circles. We'll cover group and many other powerful data analysis stages later in the course. There you have it, a high level overview of what pipelines are. At the most basic level, they are a composition of stages from one to many that we can arrange and configure in almost any way we like. The aggregation framework provides many stages to allow us to filter and transform our data. All we have to do is compose the pipeline. Some key takeaways to remember. Pipelines are a composition of stages. Stages are configurable to produce desired transformations. Documents flow through the stages like parts in an assembly line or water through a pipe. Finally, with only a few exceptions, which we'll cover later, stages can be arranged in any way we like and as many as we require. 
Let's take a few minutes to talk about the structure and syntax of the aggregation framework. The aggregation framework has a simple and reliable structure and repeatable syntax. Pipelines may contain one or more stages. Each stage is a JSON object of key value pairs. With only a few exceptions, we can have as many stages as we like. Additionally, options may be passed in. For example, specifying whether to allow disk use for large aggregations or to view the explain plan of the aggregation to see whether it is using indexes or if the server optimized the pipeline. Let's take a look at a very simple but very real pipeline and discuss the syntax. Here we have a match stage that checks whether the atmospheric composition contains oxygen or not and if the mean temperature falls within this range. Then we have a project stage that reshapes the document and calculates a new value. More on this in a moment. Lastly, this is our options object. Each stage is composed of either operators or expressions. As we continue through the course, you'll be introduced to many of these. Make sure you bookmark the Aggregation Pipeline Quick Reference page that's linked below this video. Throughout the course, we'll be using the terms operator and expression, and it's vital that you can quickly access the documentation for these. So what's an operator? For this course, when we say operators, we mean either query operators or aggregation stages. In this example, dollar $match and dollar $project are aggregation operators, and $in, $GTE, and $LTE are query operators. As a general rule, operators always appear in the key position of a document. Dollar $match is a little special, and we'll learn about it later. What's an expression? Expressions act a lot like functions. We provide arguments, and they provide a computed output. And, just like functions, expressions can be composed to form powerful new data transformations. MongoDB provides expressions for working with and producing values from many types of values. In the project stage, $GT is an expression, and its arguments are supplied in this array. And this dollar number of moons surrounded by the quotes is also an expression that you'll learn about in a moment. An easy way to remember how to use expressions is that it will always appear in a value position. Let's run this now to see the output. Here we see the result of the calculated field. It looks like Earth is the only planet that has oxygen, has a relatively comfortable temperature, and it does indeed have moons. One more important thing to cover. We may encounter syntax like this. The first is a field path expression and is used to access the value of a field in the document, like number of moons in the first example. The second, with two dollar signs followed by an uppercase word, is a system level variable. Dollar current refers to the current document, and you can find the meaning of others on the quick reference page. The last, with two dollar signs followed by a lowercase word, is a user variable. Some expressions let us temporarily bind a value to a name or provide us a special name to access some data. And there we go, the aggregation framework structure and syntax. We highly recommend that you use an editor that has bracket matching while constructing your pipelines to make noticing errors easier. There's just a few things to remember. Pipelines are always an array of one or more stages. Stages are composed of one or more aggregation operators or expressions. Expressions may take a single argument or an array of arguments. See you in the next lesson. Now that we've discussed the concept of what pipelines are and have given you an overview of aggregation structure and syntax, it's time we learn about one of the most important stages, match. The match stage is vital to a successful and performing pipeline. It should come as early as possible, and you are free to use as many match stages as necessary in your pipeline. Here is the basic syntax for MASH. Since it is an aggregation operator, we repend a dollar sign to the name. Again, MASH may be used multiple times, and virtually every other stage can be used after it, with a few exceptions that we'll cover later in the course. Instrumental in understanding MASH in the context of an aggregation pipeline, I invite you to think of MASH as a filter rather than a find. We configure the filters on our match stage, and as documents flow in, only those that meet our criteria are passed further into the pipeline. Here, our match stage will only let circles and stars through. Match uses a standard MongoDB read operation query syntax. We can perform matches based on comparison, logic, arrays, and much more. 
The only limitations are we can't use the dollar where operator, and if we want to use the dollar text operator, the match stage must be the first stage in a pipeline. If match is the first stage, it can take advantage of indexes, which increase the speed of our queries. Again, match should come early in our pipelines. As a reminder and for reference, you can find a link to this page just below the video. We encourage you to bookmark this page for future reference. Here's an example of match in use. If I execute the following aggregation, which filters the solar system collection, allowing only documents with types that don't equal star through, I can see that I get the results I expected. To show that match uses the MongoDB query syntax, let's use find to see if we get identical results. The same results. Let's observe this another way. First, let's count the number of documents with types that don't equal star. It should be eight. Now, let's see how many documents make it through our match stage. I'm going to use a utility stage in this example called count that you'll learn about later. Here, we can see that eight documents pass through our aggregation. Sorry, Pluto. Lastly, MASH does not have any mechanism for projection. With FIND, we can do something like this if we want to project out the underscore ID field. Although this may seem like a limitation, we will soon learn about a powerful stage that allows us to do this and much, much more. And that's it for MATCH. Again, we encourage you to think of MATCH as more of a filter than a FIND. Once documents are in an aggregation pipeline, and we're shaping them with new fields and new data, we'll be using match heavily to keep filtering documents out. Some key things to remember. A match stage may contain a dollar text query operator, but it must be the first stage in a pipeline. Match should come early in an aggregation pipeline. You cannot use dollar where with match, and match uses the same query syntax as find. The next stage we'll learn about is project. Project, like match, is a vital stage to thoroughly understand to be successful with the aggregation framework. Please don't think of project like the projection functionality available with the find query operator. While it is true, project is much, much more. Not only can we selectively remove and retain fields, we can reassign existing field values and derive entirely new fields. A common method or function available in many programming languages is map. It is a higher order function that applies some transformation among a collection. If match is like a filter method, project is like map. Here is the basic syntax for project. We prepend a dollar sign to signify that it is an aggregation operator, then open up with a curly brace and close with the curly brace. Between these two braces is where we use aggregation expressions and perform field logic. More on that soon. Here is how we'd specify values to remove and retain just like the projection functionality available with the find query operator. This specifies that we wish to remove the underscore ID and retain the name field. Notice that since we have specified a value to retain, we must specify each value we wish to retain. Let's also keep the gravity field so we can see some difference in real data. And of course, an exception. Here we can see we're getting the name and the gravity field, but we're also getting the underscore ID field. The underscore ID field is the only field that we must explicitly remove. All others will be removed when we specify at least one field to retain. Also, it looks like whoever put this data together uses the international system of units, so let's also just get the value. An error. One thing to keep in mind, once we start diving into documents and selecting on subfields, we must surround our arguments with quotes. There, the data we wanted. Project is already showing to be pretty useful, but so far it appears to be identical to projection available with the find query operator. Let's start exploring what makes project so powerful. Instead of returning a subdocument with just the value field, let's directly assign the value to the gravity field. Here, we can see that we are indeed reassigning the gravity field to now contain the information that was available at gravity.value. We're prepending gravity.value with a dollar sign. This is one of the many aggregation expressions, and we're directing the aggregation framework to look for and fetch the information in the document at gravity.value. 
or a field path expression. As discussed in the aggregation structure and syntax lesson, this is one of the ways we reference documents for information. We can also create a new field called surface gravity. This isn't just renaming the gravity field, it's creating an entirely new field. Very powerful, and we'll be using this functionality a lot through the course. Let's have a bit of fun and use the aggregation framework to calculate a value. I'd like to see what my weight would be on each main body in the solar system. I'm going to have to use an expression to accomplish this. We'll cover expressions in much greater detail shortly, but I'm going to break this down since this is our first time seeing it and the syntax can catch people off guard. I weigh about 86 kilograms. Looking at our previous results, it looks like if I divide the gravity of a body by the gravity of Earth and then multiply that value by my weight, I can find out how much I'd weigh on every main body. I'm going to have to use an expression to accomplish this. The first expression I'm going to use is the multiply arithmetic expression. Multiply takes an array of values and multiplies them together. So, I know I need to multiply my weight times the ratio of a specific planet's gravity divided by the Earth's gravity. That will look something like this. I know my weight is about 86 kilograms, so I can just hard code that for now. To calculate the gravity ratio, I'll need to use the divide arithmetic expression. Divide takes an array of two values and divides the first by the second. Within divide, I'll need to reference the information at the value subfield within gravity. Let's see what this would look like. Here, we're using a field path expression to refer to information within the document, specifically the information found at the value field within the gravity field. I know the gravity of Earth is around 9.8 meters per second per second, so I'll just hard code that in. So putting it all together, we have the following. All of this is assigned to a new field we create called my weight. Awesome. We can see I'd weigh about 32.5 kilograms on Mars and 2,404 kilograms on the Sun. We're beginning to see the power of Project. Project is a powerful stage of the aggregation framework. Not only can we remove and retain fields, we can derive new fields and reassign existing fields. Project may be used as many times as desired within an aggregation pipeline, and it should be used aggressively to trim data out of documents that isn't required in order to keep our pipelines performant. Some key things to remember. Once we specify one field to retain, we must specify all fields we want to retain. The underscore ID field is the only exception to this. Beyond simply removing and retaining fields, Project lets us add new fields. Project can be used as many times as required within an aggregation pipeline. And finally, Project can be used to reassign values to existing field names and to derive entirely new fields. Now that we've got the basics of Project, it's time we discuss aggregation expressions. We've discussed them briefly, and now it's time to examine them more thoroughly. Expressions are the core units of the aggregation framework. If an aggregation pipeline is a conveyor belt that we can place different stages upon to build our desired result, expressions are the tools in each stage that actually perform these transformations. Expressions are the functions of the aggregation framework. Just like functions, they take an argument and return a result. Here, we have identical add functions in Python, the C family of languages, and the MongoDB aggregation framework. Executing any of them would produce identical results. Here are some expressions available to us. We can use boolean, set, comparison, variable, literal, arithmetic, string, text search, array, data type, conditional, date, and accumulator expressions. As we can see, there are a lot of expressions available to us. While the names can be very descriptive, we're going to need details on how to use them. Additionally, some expressions can only be used in specific stages. To get that information, we invite you to bookmark the Aggregation Pipeline Quick Reference page. The link is below this video. Now, I'd really like to round to the nearest integer, but I can see that currently there's no expression named round. I can round to the nearest integer by adding 0.5 to a value and then flooring the result, and I can see that there are both the add and the floor expression. 
Just like functions, expressions can be composed together to perform more complex calculations. We've done this already when calculating our weight on various bodies in the solar system. So, let's make our own round expression. We won't actually be able to reference it with dollar sign around, but it will be functionally identical. Let's look at this in action by rounding the radius value in our documents to the nearest integer. We reference the information we want from a document by prepending a dollar sign. Again, this is called the field path expression. Then, we compose two expressions to produce the desired results. As a reminder, we can also use the system variable dollar dollar current to reference the value we want as well. We've now discussed expressions fairly in depth. Some key things to remember about expressions. Expressions are equivalent to functions. Specific syntax and argument ordering within an expression is dependent upon the expression. The syntax is predictable, but expressions vary on whether they require arguments in an array or not. Usually, if an expression takes two arguments, they're given as in an array. And some expressions will produce different results based on the ordering of arguments. Always look up expressions from MongoDB documentation to ensure you understand their use. Lastly, expressions are composable. Oftentimes, we may find it necessary to combine two or more expressions. Good luck! It is time we discuss some useful utility stages, what we call cursor-like stages. These stages are sort, skip, limit, and count, and they have an equivalent in our query language as a cursor method. Let's have a look. After connecting to my aggregations database, I can express this simple query on solar system, where I'm going to find all my documents. This is a full collection scan and only projecting out the name, number of moons, and keeping out the underscore ID. If I do this, I can see all the results of my collection, only exposing the name, number of moons, per each one of the documents. Sweet, this works well. The other thing I can do is basically call count. Now, this will count the full amount of documents returned by the query. Here I can see that I have on my solar system nine documents. Another thing that I can do is basically skip five documents. And if I execute this query, I can see that I skipped a few first documents. Now, if you are wondering why did I get this order, why did I skip those previous five documents and not others, if I do not specify a sorting operation or a sorting of my cursor, I will get from MongoDB the order by which the documents are inserted in the collection, what we call the natural order of the collection. So in this case, I'm going to skip the five first elements that have been inserted into this collection. The following method will be limit, where I can specify the number of documents that I'm going to return. And again, following the exactly same sorting order, which in this case is going to be my natural insert sorting order on our solar system collection, I'll get the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, which are the five first documents of my collection. And lastly, I can also specify a sort for the result set of my collection. Here, I'm going to find everything, but instead of giving back the order by which documents are inserted in, in the collection. I'm going to sort the result set based on the number of moons that each one of these documents contain. Minus one specifies the order, and in this case, it will be descending. So as we can see, we are going to get first the ones that have more moons to the ones that have less moons. Now we've seen the cursor methods, but we also have stages that execute exactly the same kind of functionality. We have dollar limit, skip, dollar count, and dollar sort. They will vary a little bit on the syntax, where limit will take an integer, skip will take also an integer, specifying the number of limit documents and the number of skip documents. Count, on the other hand, we will need to specify a field where we want to collect the count value 
and sort, we need to specify the keys and the order by which we want our result sets of the pipeline to be sorted. Let's see some of this in action. Now, to mimic exactly the same operation as before in our find command, I'm going to execute a project of name and number of moons, excluding underscore ID. Exactly the same operation as before. And in this case, given the pipeline that I'm executing and given the documents that this aggregation pipeline will provide, I will add a limit stage to my pipe saying I only want the first five documents coming from this project stage. And as expected, I get the same results as I would if I would limit on a find operation. The following stage will be skip. And again, given the results incoming from the project stage, I will skip only one. In this case, I'm going to skip the sun. So how do I know that I'm going to skip the sun? Well, basically, the order by which I'm going to get the results into the project is the natural order, exactly in the same way as we've seen before. The project will filter out only the fields that I'm interested on and pass along that to the skip stage. Skip by skipping it one, I'm going to be skipping the sun. And as you can see here, all different celestial bodies will be reported back in my result, except for the sun, which is the first element, the one that I'm skipping in the pipeline. We also have our count stage. The count stage counts all incoming documents. The argument to count is the field name on which we're going to collect that count value in a document of the results. In this case, I'm going to filter our collection so we only look at documents that are terrestrial planets. Here I'm specifying that match, where the type of the document will have the value terrestrial planet. Then, from the results from match, which are then dispatched to the project stage, I'm going to filter only name and number of moons, removing ID, as we've done before. And from all of the documents coming from the pipeline, I'm then going to count them. The count will give me back a result document, which has a field that I specified here, terrestrial planets, which contains the value of number of documents that are of type terrestrial planet. Now, for this particular pipeline here, where the end result is going to be the count of the number of documents which have a type of terrestrial planet, the project stage here is a little bit of an annoyance. It doesn't really interfere with the end result of the pipeline. So if we would just remove it, and we just have a match and then count, we can see that I get exactly the same execution and exactly the same results, having or not a project in between the match and the count. Lastly, let's look at, at the sort. Sort needs to be supplied with the field we want to sort on. In this case, if I'm going to project name and number of moons, I can sort on the fields that I'm collecting from the incoming pipeline. So in this case, if I want to sort on the number of moons descending, I'll get the result as expected, where I get the planet which has more moons first, and on that order till the ones that have absolutely no moons, like Sun, Mercury, and Venus. Poor guys. An important aspect to refer here is that the sort stage is not limited to just one single field. It will operate on multiple different fields in combination, as we would, we would do in normal queries in find operations. If we want to sort first on one field and then on another, that is totally possible in the aggregation pipeline stage as well. So let's say here, for example, that I have this different project where I'm going to project as well, apart from name and number of moons, the field has magnetic field, which is a Boolean field. In the sort stage, I can specify that I want to sort on as magnetic field descending and number of moons descending. By executing this specific query, we get a very similar result as before, where we're going to have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and so on. The only difference is that, for example, Sun and Mercury will come before Mars. So how is that possible? Well, the result set is being 
sorted first on the field as magnetic field equals true, and then on the number of moons. So first I'm going to have all the ones that has magnetic field is equals to true, and then after that I'm going to sort on the number of moons for the result set. Now if sort is near the beginning of our pipeline and placed before a project, an unwind and a group stage, it can take advantage of indexes. Otherwise, this sort stage will perform an in-memory sort, which will greatly increase the memory consumption of our server. Sort operations within the aggregation pipeline are limited to 100 megabytes of RAM by default. To allow handling larger data sets, we need to allow disk use, which is an aggregation pipeline option that we can provide to the aggregate function. By doing so, we will be performing the excess of 100 megabytes of memory required to do a sort using disk to help us sort out the results. So in short, sort, skip, limit, and count are functionally equivalent to the similar named cursor methods. Sort can take advantage of indexes if it's near the beginning of our pipeline and before a project, group, or unwind stages. By default, the sort stage will only take up to 100 megabytes of RAM. For more than that, we will need to provide the allow disk usage option equals true to our pipeline. If we do not do this so, the operation will be terminated on the server. And that's all we have for you in cursor-like stages of the, our aggregation pipeline. The next stage we'll learn about is the dollar group stage. Key to our comprehension of group is to understand the one required argument, the underscore ID field of this stage. The expression or expressions we specify to underscore ID becomes the criteria the group stage uses to categorize and bundle documents together. In this picture, we're grouping coins based on their denomination, so the expression specified to underscore ID would be the denomination field path. Let's view this in action using real data. All right, let's group documents in our movies collection based on the value they have in their year field. By grouping, we can see we have fundamentally changed the structure of the resulting documents. Group match them based on the value of the year field. Documents with identical values got bundled together, and each unique value produced an output document that shows us the values or value we grouped on. By itself, this may or may not be useful depending on your use case, and just grouping on one expression is functionally equivalent to using the distinct command. Let's explore the other powerful feature of the group stage, the ability to use aggregation accumulator expressions. We can specify additional fields we want to calculate in the group stage, and as many as we require to accomplish our goal. Here, we are going to group on the value of year as before. We also calculate a new field, called num films in year using the dollar sum accumulator expression. Each time group categorizes a document for us, the sum expression gets called. Since we specified a value of 1, each matching document is going to sum 1 to the value of num films in year. Let's see it in action. The same results as before with the addition of the num films in year field. We can see that there was only one document with the value 1874 in the year field, while there were 2058 documents with the value 2014. Quite a busy year. Let's perform the same aggregation with the sort stage appended to the end to order our results. Great. We can start to get an indication that as the year value increases, we have more documents in our collection. This brings up an important point about the expression we specify to underscore ID. Document values used in the expression must resolve to the same value or combination of values in order for documents to match. Let's look at an example. Here, we're using the size expression to get the value of the director's array. I'm wrapping it in this $con conditional expression because if the value we specify to size doesn't evaluate to an array or is missing, size will error. So, if directors is an array, return the size of directors, otherwise zero. As documents flow in, this will be evaluated, and documents with the same number of directors will be grouped together.
All documents without director information or with an empty array for directors will be grouped as well. We call the field num directors, but could have given it any name we wanted. We'll calculate a field called num films and just count how many documents match. We'll also average the Metacritic information and assign that to a field called Average Metacritic for all the matching documents in a group. Lastly, we'll just sort documents in descending order. Let's see it in action. Wow, a film with 44 directors, but the average Metacritic is null. Let's explore this by looking at the document. All right, scanning the document, we can see that the Metacritic field is missing entirely. This illustrates an important concept. It's crucial to understand the type of data coming in to properly interpret the results we calculate, and we may be required to sanitize our input in some way to calculate a result at all. Accumulator expressions will ignore documents with a value at the specified field that isn't of the type the expression expects or if the value is missing. If all documents encountered have an incorrect data type or a missing value for the desired field, the expression will result in null. Okay, we're gaining a good understanding of how both the expression supplied to the underscore ID field groups documents and how expressions specified to our accumulators work. But what if we wanted to group all documents rather than just a subset? By convention, we specify null or an empty string as the argument to underscore ID. Before we run this pipeline, let's set an expectation. I expect the value of count to be equal to the number of documents in the movies collection. Let's test. All right, 44,497. And the total number of documents? Again, 44,497, an exact match. Rather than duplicating functionality in a very unoptimized way, let's do something that is useful for all documents. Let's calculate the average Metacritic rating. Here, we use a math stage to filter documents out with a Metacritic that isn't greater than or equal to zero. Documents missing Metacritic information or with a non-numeric value at that field won't make it through. And we can see the average Metacritic rating among all documents that had Metacritic information is around 56.93. And that covers the group stage. Let's summarize. Underscore ID is where we specify what incoming documents should be grouped on. We can use all accumulator expressions within group. Group can be used multiple times within a pipeline, and it may be necessary to sanitize incoming data. Let's take a moment to learn about using accumulator expressions with the project stage. Knowledge of how to use these expressions can greatly simplify our work. One important thing to keep in mind is that accumulator expressions within Project work over an array within the given document. They do not carry values forward to each document encountered. Let's suppose we have a collection named example with this schema. If we perform this aggregation, this will be the result. An output document for every input document with the average of that document's data field. For this lesson, we're going to explore this data set. It's the average monthly low and high temperature for the United States, as well as monthly ice cream consumer price index and sales information. And here's what the data looks like in our collection. We can see we have a trends array with documents that contain all the information we'll need. Easy enough to work with. Let's go ahead and find the maximum and minimum values for the average high temperature. We'll explore two different methods to find the maximum. First, We'll use the dollar $reduce expression to manually find the maximum. Before I run this, let's break it down. Here, I'm specifying the reduce expression. Reduce takes an array as its input argument, here. For the argument to initial value, the value our accumulator will begin with, we're specifying negative infinity. I hope we'll never have a monthly average high temperature of negative infinity. But in all seriousness, we're using negative infinity because any reasonable value we encounter should be greater. Lastly, we we'll specify the logic to the in field here. This is using the dollar con conditional operator and saying if dollar dollar this dot average high temperature is greater than the value which is held in our accumulator, then return this dot average high temperature. Otherwise, just return the value back. 
So, compare the current value against the accumulator value, and if it's greater, we'll replace it with the value we just encountered. Otherwise, we'll just keep using our current max value. Notice the double dollar signs. These are temporary variables defined for use only within the dollar reduce expression, as we mentioned in the aggregation structure and syntax lesson. Dollar this refers to the current element in the array. Dollar value refers to the accumulator value. It will do this for every element in the array. Okay, let's run this. And we see the max i was 87. Wow, that was pretty complicated. Let's look at an easier way to accomplish this. I think we can all agree that this is much simpler. We use the dollar max group accumulator expression to get the information we want. And again, we get max high of 87. Okay, let's get the minimum average temperature. Here, we use the dollar min accumulator expression. And we can see our max low was 27. All right, we now know how to use max and min. We can also calculate averages and standard deviations. Let's calculate the average consumer price index for ice cream as well as its standard deviation. Here, we're calculating both in one pass. For the average CPI field, we specify the dollar AVG average expression, telling it to average the values in the ice cream CPI field in the trends array. And here, the CPI deviation is calculated almost identically, except we're using the population standard deviation. We're using standard deviation POP because we're looking at the entire set of data. However, if this was only a sample of our data, we'd use the sample standard deviation expression. Great, we can see that the average consumer price index was 221.275, and the standard deviation was around 6.63. We could use this information to find data that is outside norms to point to areas that might need special analysis. The last accumulator expression I'd like to show is dollar $sum. As the name implies, sum sums up the values of an array. We can see that the yearly sales were 1,601 million. And that covers accumulator expressions available within Project. Here are a few things to keep in mind. The available accumulator expressions in Project are sum, average, max, min, standard deviation population, and standard deviation sample. Within Project, these expressions will not carry their value forward and operate across multiple documents. For this, we need to use the unwind stage and group accumulator expressions. For more complex calculations, it's handy to know how to use dollar $reduce and dollar $map. Let's learn about another useful aggregation stage, the dollar $unwind stage. Dollar $unwind lets us unwind in an array field, creating a new document for every entry where the field value is now each entry. Let's visualize this with an example. If I have the following scheme on the left, title and genres, and unwind on the genres field, I'll get back documents on the right. What? Am I saying that I'm generating a document for each array entry? When it was all tight and well embedded, why might this be useful? One example is one we'd like to group on individual entries. In the group lesson, we grouped movies based on their year. Had we tried to group on year and genres, we would have gotten back many distinct entries because within group, arrays are matched on pure equality, not equivalence. So, this array of adventure, action, would not match this array of action adventure. All right, let's use unwind for something real. Let's find the most popular genres by year from 2010 to 2015 within the movies collection. I'm going to go ahead and limit this and say that I'm only considering entries with a runtime of 90 minutes or greater, and for popularity, I'll use the value in imdb.rating. Okay, let's break this down. Here, we will begin with the match stage, ensuring we have an imdb.rating value by specifying that it must be greater than zero, and filtering documents based on year and runtime. Then, we unwind the genres array, creating a new document for each entry in the original array. Then, we'll group on the year and the now single value genres field, and use the average expression to calculate the average rating from imdb.rating. 
Finally, we sort. First, on the year descending, and then the average rating descending. Let's test it out. Hmm, it's close, but not quite there yet. We can see we're getting the most popular genre by year, but we're getting all results back. We just want a single document per year with the highest rated genre. There are many ways to accomplish this. Let's look at one of the most simple. Okay, let's examine this new pipeline. It's identical to the previous one with the addition of these two stages. The previous pipeline was returning in the format we wanted. There were just too many documents being returned. Here, in this additional group stage, we group documents together based on their year, and since they're already sorted in the order we need, we just take the first value we encounter for the genre and the average rating. Then, we finish with the sort to make sure that they're returned in the order we want. Let's see if it works. Excellent. One document per year with the highest rated genre in that year. Okay, we've seen how Unwind works. Now there's a few last things to cover. We've been using the short form for Unwind. Here's the long form for contrast. In the long form, we specify the array we want to unwind by providing a field path expression to the path argument. We can provide a string to include a array index. This will create another field in the document with whatever name we specify, with the value set to the index of the element in the original array. Lastly, we can provide a true or false value to preserve null and empty arrays. True will create an entry with an empty array if the value specified in the path is either null, missing, or an empty array. One more thing of note. If the documents in our collection are very large and we need to use Unwind, we may exceed the default memory limit of the aggregation framework. As always, match early, retain only the information needed with Project, and remember that we can specify to allow disk use. And that covers Unwind. We've learned a lot. Let's recap on a few things. Unwind only works on an array of values. There are two forms for Unwind the short form and long form. Using unwind on large collections with big documents may lead to performance issues. Now it's time we learn about lookup, a powerful stage that lets you combine information from two collections. For those with some knowledge of SQL, lookup is effectively a left outer join. If that didn't make any sense, don't worry. Let's break it down. In database terms, a left outer join combines all documents or entries on the left with matching documents or entries from the right. So A left outer join with B would look like this. The lookup stage has this form. The from field here is the collection from which we want to look up documents. Keep in mind that the collection you specify in the from field cannot be sharded and must exist within the same database. Local field here is a field in the working collection where we express the aggregation command that we want to compare to. Foreign field here is the field we want to compare from in the collection we specified and from. Lookup will perform a strict equality comparison. And the as field here is a new field name we specify that will show up in our documents that contains any matches between local field and foreign field. All matches will be put in an array in this field. If there were no matches, the field will contain an empty array. Let's visualize this in an example. Suppose we're aggregating over an airline's collection, and we want to fetch which alliance the airline belongs to. As the argument to from would specify air alliances. Next, we would specify name as the argument to local field, the value we want to compare to. The argument to local field can result to either an array or a single value. Then, we would specify airlines as the argument to foreign field, the value we want to compare from. The argument to foreign field can also resolve to either an array or a single value. We can see that based on the argument so far, Penguin Air won't match anything. Delta Airlines will match Sky Team, and Lufthansa will match Star Alliance. Those matches will be brought into the current document as Alliance. We could have given any string value we wanted, but keep in mind that if we specify a name that already exists in the working document, that field will be overwritten. 
Notice here that because the document with name Penguin Air did not have any results, there is an empty array. Oftentimes after a lookup, we want to follow it with a match stage to filter documents out. Another thing to note, lookup retrieves the entire document that matched, not just the field we specified to foreign field. All right, let's look at lookup in actual use. Let's combine information from the Air Airlines collection with the Air Alliances collection, putting all the airline information within the Alliance document. First, let's look at the schema in our Air Alliances collection. Okay, the data we need for local field is in the Airlines field. Let's look at the Airlines schema so we know what value to use as the foreign field. All right, easy enough. It looks like the information we need for foreign field is in the name field. That should be all the information we need. Let's build the pipeline. All right, we specify Air Airlines to the from field, Airlines as the local field, Name as the foreign field, and here we chose to override the Airlines field with the information we get back. It makes sense. We'll be replacing the names with entire documents. Let's see the output. Pretty cool. We can see that Lookup did just what we expected it to do. We could follow this with some projections or even another lookup stage to perform some powerful reshaping and analysis. But for now, that's enough. We've covered a lot of information in this lesson. Lookup is a powerful stage that can help reduce network requests and combine information from different collections together for powerful and deep analysis. Here are a few things to keep in mind. The from field cannot be shorted. The from collection must be in the same database. The values in local field and foreign field are matched on equality. And as can be any name, but if it exists in the working document, that field will be overwritten. Let's discuss another aggregation stage, graph lookup. Graph lookup allows us to recursively traverse a graph structure represented in documents. Graph lookup has the following form. Let's go over the parameters. Since it's a lookup operation, we specified the collection where we want to perform the graph search using the from field. We have to specify start with, the initial field that we should start with in the current document. This will be used to initially start the matching and subsequent recursive travel. Start with must be an expression. Connect to field and connect from field, which are the fields that we are going to link using the field value of the connect from field query against the connect to field in a recursive fashion. On the first operation, start with will compare its value to the value of the field in connect to field. These are specified as strings, not as field path expressions. As determines the name of the field that will hold the result, and just like lookup, it will be an array, empty if there were no successful matches. And then we have our optional fields. Max depth determines how deep we want to go on our recursive search. Depth field is a name that we provide, which will be assigned the depth that GraphLug had to go in order to find that entry. And lastly, we have a restrict search with match, where we can specify a filter to be applied on each of the matching recursive lookup documents. So, imagine we have a collection with the following documents that we'd like to explore. And this is a visualization of the graph they would form, with the nodes and edges. We'll specify a start with of node, which identifies the field to begin the search from. For our connect from field, we'll specify the connections field. This will compare the value, or values in this case because it is an array, to the connect to field. And this will match the document with a value of 4 for node because we specify node as the connect to field. So node 4 connects to 1, 2, and 5. We've already traversed from 1 to 4, so that's not necessary. Node 2 connects to node 4 and 5. We don't need to visit node 4, so we visit node 5. Node 5 connects to nodes 2, 3, and 4. We've already visited nodes 2 and 4 now, so we go to node 3. Node 3 only connects to node 5, which has already been traversed, so we end there. Let's look at that in action. First, let's insert our nodes. Let's go ahead and construct our aggregation. 
We use the match stage before graph lookup so we can see the same output as what the slide showed. We specify graph to from, the name of the collection. Remember, it doesn't have to be the same collection we're aggregating over, but the collection to from can't be sharded, just like the lookup stage. We specified node to start with, connections as a connect from field, and node as a connect to field. Lastly, we specified as as demo. And the results are just as we expected. Looking at the demo field, we can see that the first entry at the bottom was node 1, which connects to node 4. The next entry is node 4, which connects to 1, 2, and 5. The next is 2, which connects to 4 and 5. Then we have node 5, which connects to 2, 3, and 4. And lastly, we have node 3, which connects to node 5. Now we've already visited every single node, so here the graph lookup would stop. Let's look at a more concrete example. Let's say I'm on vacation in Germany, and I decide I'd like to catch a flight somewhere new on Lufthansa Airlines. I don't like to sit for a long time, so I only want a maximum of two layovers. Let's look at the schema. Here's the document where the airline name is Lufthansa and the source airport is TXL, which is in Berlin. We have a good starting point, so let's build our aggregation. To from will specify air routes. We'll start with the source airport, which is TXL. Our connect from field will be the destination airport, and our connect to field will be the source airport. Let's go over this before we run it. We'll go ahead and restrict possible starting points to those that leave from Berlin, airport code TXL, and are operated by Lufthansa. In the graph lookup stage, I'll specify air routes to from. Start with is the value of the source airport field, which we know is TXL. And then we recursively search, connecting destination airports with source airports with a max depth of two. I've included a depth field and called it hops so that I can filter these results later. I restrict the search to only match routes operated by Lufthansa. In the add field stage, I filter the quick trips array I created with the graph lookup stage to only destinations that are two hops away. I may as well make the most out of my vacation. Let's take a look. And based on the results, it looks like I have a ton of options. Let's summarize. Graph lookup requires to run on the primary shard in a sharded environment because it can only look up from other collections in the same database and those collections can't be sharded. Specifying allow disk use true has no effect on the graph lookup stage. If it exceeds 100 megabytes of memory, it will fail. And failing to specify a max depth can result in a very long running operation depending on the graph like structure and size of the data in your collection. Welcome to week two. In week one's lessons, you learned the fundamentals of MongoDB's powerful aggregation framework. And this week, you're going to build upon that foundation. Let's discuss some of the topics that will be covered in week two of this course. Week two is going to cover the following topics. First, we're going to discuss the importance of schema design, how we organize the data within MongoDB to be performant and easy to work with. Next, we'll see a few different examples of how to explore and inspect your MongoDB schema. We'll then learn how to use the aggregation framework to migrate a schema. We'll then follow that up with some practical uses for dollars and graph lookup so you can perform very powerful transformations. And then finally, we'll explore some entity re resolution examples. With many of these topics, you won't be limited to just reading data from MongoDB. You'll actually begin to write data to your own MongoDB Atlas cluster. This is going to be a very exciting week, and we wish you the best of luck with week two. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the Mongo import command. So oftentimes, you're going to have data that isn't already in MongoDB. For those cases when your data is stored in either JSON or CSV formats, the Mongo import command is a very easy way to get that data into MongoDB. You've likely already seen the Mongo import command before now, but in this lesson we're going to dive into a few specific features of the command. We'll see how we can import CSV data into MongoDB. Moreover, we'll see how we can specify what we want our field names and data types to be. 
And then finally, we'll look at some pretty cool options when inserting that data into MongoDB. For this lesson, we're going to import an online retail data set from the UCI machine learning repository. We're going to go ahead and click this data folder right here. And then we can go ahead and click this online retail.xlsx file. Unfortunately, you can see that this data set is an XLSX file, which is Microsoft Excel's proprietary data format. We really need to get this to become a CSV. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this document into Microsoft Excel. And from here, I can go ahead and save it as a CSV. I'll click Save. I know that not everyone has access to Microsoft Excel, so this CSV file will be attached as a handout in the lesson notes. I've already CD'd into the directory that I saved my retail.csv file. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at the first 10 lines of the file. And you can see that we first have this nice little header line, and then below that we have the first nine rows of our orders. And you know, we can see this data is pretty relational, and this is because the invoice number is repeated for quite a while here. We can go ahead and fix that once we have our data into MongoDB by putting it into a document model, but now let's just focus on getting this data first into MongoDB. Before we begin importing this data with Mongo Import, or talk about some of the cool features of Mo Mongo Import, I first want to point out the help page. So by running this command, you can see all of the different options that you can pass to Mongo Import, and you can see all their descriptions. We're only going to discuss a few of these in this lesson, but I want to emphasize the importance of being able to read a page like this to learn about all of Mongo Import's functionality. So please feel free to pause the video, run this command for yourself, and read about the different options. I'm going to import this retail data set into my MongoDB free tier cluster by clicking on the cluster and then clicking Command Line Tools. From here, I can go ahead and scroll down to data import and export tools, I can go ahead and click copy to copy this command for Mongo import. Here I can go ahead and paste this command, but before I fill in these different pieces, we're going to go back to Atlas so that I can copy my connection string so we can use Compass to view the data in my free tier cluster. We'll click overview, and then from overview, we can click connect. And then from here, we'll go ahead and scroll down to connect with MongoDB Compass. We'll click copy. Now when I open MongoDB Compass, I'm immediately prompted to go ahead and import my connection string. So I'll go ahead and click Yes. It'll fill in these fields. I'll then type in my super secret password and hit Connect. And you can see I really don't have much going on here. Let's go ahead and fix this by importing our retail CSV. First, I'll go ahead and replace my password. And then I'll go ahead and change my database to Coursera-ag. I'll change my collection to whatever we want to call it. What am I going to call it? I'm going to call it probably orders. I'm going to change the type to CSV. We support both JSON and CSV types. And then finally, I'll pass in the file path, which is just retail.csv. Now let's execute the command. Hmm. What happened here? Well, the command failed. And when we read the error output, we can see that we must specify fields, fields file, or header line to import this file type. This is because we're trying to import a CSV file. With JSON, every value of data already has a corresponding field. With CSVs, this isn't always the case, which is why you either need to pass in a field array, a field file that contains those field names, or you need to have a header line and then have the first line of your CSV contain the column names. Fortunately for us, our file has a header, so we're going to just go ahead and specify header line. Let's go ahead and try it again. Awesome. You can see that we were able to import 541,909 documents. Now we can go ahead and head back to Compass. So to go ahead and refresh Compass, we can go ahead and click this little icon right here. And now we can see our new Coursera Ag database. And inside here, you can now see the retail collection with the same amount of documents. We can go ahead and drill in here. And here you can see that Mongo Import was able to infer the different data types. Here this is an integer. Here this is now a string. But unfortunately, with things like this, here we have a date, but the date is actually encoded as a string, which makes sense because Mongo import doesn't know about the format of the date. But we really prefer this to be a, a native date data type. Moreover, when we go over to the schema tab and click analyze schema, and what this lets us do is see the breakdown of our data. So here we can see customer ID is 75% of the time an integer, but 25% of the time it's a string. And we can also see kind of the breakdown of those different values. Let's see how we can fix this with Mongo import. 
So Mongo import has a flag called columns have types. And this allows us to specify the data type for a field by appending it to the field's name. To do this, we're going to go ahead and slightly modify our CSV file. Like I said, we need to append the data type to the end of each field name. Here's the syntax for doing so. First, we go ahead and separate the field name from the type with a dot. For invoice number, we saw that it was mostly an integer, but occasionally a string. So let's go ahead and make it a string always for consistency. So I'm just going to type string, and then I'm going to put in two parentheses at the end, almost like as if this was a function call. We'll go ahead and do the same for stock code and description. In Compass, we saw that quantity was always an integer, so we're going to go ahead and change that to an int32. And now this one's a bit tricky. So invoice date is currently a string, but we'd really prefer it to be a date. But you'll notice we have a very particular format for our date time. It's two digits for the month, but it looks like we only do that um, if there are two digits in the month because the day only has one digit. The year only has two digits. And then the time, I know that I've seen times farther than this, but this is actually 24 hour time. So this is actually 8.26 AM. And of course the date and the time are separated by a space and the date, each element is separated by a slash and the separate the hour from the minute is separated by a colon. So to tell Mongo import how to parse these different date time fields, so we're going to go ahead and do dot date parentheses and then inside those parentheses, we're going to use Golang's date parsing syntax. And this is because MongoDB's command line tools, like Mongo import, are written in Golang. So what this means is that we need to specify a very specific time as our example. Specifically, we're going to give the time of Monday, January 2nd at 3.04.05 p.m. in the year 2006. So for that date, we just need to provide that date in the format that our file uses. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to say January 2nd, 06, which follows the format that we've been using. Then I'm going to give it a space, going to do 24 hour time colon, and the number of minutes, which is at four minutes after 3 p.m. And that's how we specify the date. Now we can go ahead and move on to unit price. For unit price, since this is a dollar value, we really want to make sure that we have precision when doing math. So we're going to make it a decimal type. Customer ID will make a string, and of course country will make a string as well. Now we'll go ahead and save this file, and now we'll go ahead and add columns have types to the end of our command, and we'll run it again. Great, you can see that we again imported 541,909 documents. So now back in Compass, we can go ahead and click refresh. Now after refreshing Compass, we can see our new documents, and you'll see that, oh no, wait, this is supposed to be a string. Why is this an integer? And this is supposed to be a date. Oh, well, under closer inspection, we can see that we now have 1.1 million documents instead of about 500,000. And that's because we just re-imported all those documents again. So now we have a bunch of duplicates. Let's look at how we can fix this. The easiest way to fix this is to append the dash dash drop option to our command, which will first drop our collection before importing any documents. And now after importing our 541,909 documents, and now when we refresh Compass again, we can see that our date field is truly of a date data type and the invoice number and stock codes are both strings like we would expect. Now let's imagine for a second that this collection, before we imported any data, already contained some data. This would mean when we use dash dash drop, we would delete data that we really wanted to keep. Well, there's a really cool trick for these types of situations. You can use the dash dash mode flag and pass an argument whether you want to insert, upsert, which means to replace an existing document with a new one, or insert a document if those fields don't already exist, or merge, which means to replace only the fields of the new data that we're importing and keep the other fields the same. In our case, upsert will work well because we just really want to replace the entire document with the new proper ones. Before running this command, we'll need one other flag, which is upsert fields. And this tells Mongo import which field or fields to use to determine which document in the collection should be replaced by the current new one. For us, that means we need to use both invoice number and stock code since together they're unique across all the documents in our collection. 
Now when we execute this, you'll notice that this command runs much, much more slowly than our previous commands. And this is because for every document that we're inserting, the server needs to query the database on invoice number and stock code, and then fetch that document so that it can replace it. Our drop command worked fine, so let's go ahead and cancel this. And that's a pretty good practical overview of Mongo import. Let's recap. So in this lesson, we saw how we can import CSV data into Atlas using Mongo import. We also saw how we can specify the field names via a CSV header. Similarly, we saw how we can append data type info to those column names so that information can be passed on to MongoDB. Additionally, we saw how to use the dash dash drop option to prevent duplicates when running multiple re-imports. And finally, we saw a cool trick of how to update existing documents in MongoDB by using dash dash mode equal upsert or dash dash mode equals merge. In this lesson, let's talk about the importance of schema design. With MongoDB, you have a lot of flexibility. On one hand, you can throw totally unrelated things in the same collection. You can insert a insurance policy, a movie description, and a news article all into the exact same collection. However, this is unlikely to be a good design and may make finding information or grouping it a little bit challenging. On the other hand, you can make your data very strict and relational where every document has the exact same and only the exact same fields as every other one. In real life, data tends to be somewhere in between these two extremes. Oftentimes you'll have similar characteristics, but also slight differences. And this is why MongoDB has a flexible schema that allows you to store real life data. As it has been said by a few people before me, if you don't have a schema, you should look harder. And this is because whether your schema is explicit or not, you still have one. Now, it is important to consider your schema when you design your database. And this is because you might want to group similar things together, or you might want to query for similar objects together. Moreover, you might want to try to identify common characteristics among your documents through aggregation. So currently, your schema might not be very explicit, but we strongly recommend that you do think about your schema and make it more explicit. This will make your life a lot better down the road. So what does a schema consist of and how do we make a good schema? Well, in the relational world, we generally think about our data first and we think about the relationships among that data when we're designing a schema. But in the MongoDB or in the NoSQL world, there's this now new emphasis on performance when it comes to schema design. And because of this, rather than focusing on data and relationships, we focus on data access patterns and queries. With MongoDB, it's important to think about what data you're going to query for, and in turn, that will help you design your schema. With MongoDB, you get the flexibility of making your schema however you want, rather with the relational world, your data and its relationships ultimately dictate your schema. Since we're focusing on performance and access patterns, this means it's gonna be important for you to identify which queries you care about having the most performance and which queries you're going to be running most frequently. After you've identified these queries, you can then start to think about entity relationships between your data. For example, you can have a one to n relationship. For example, we have a movie where a movie has many different actors. However, this data could also be modeled in an end to n relationship type of way. And this is because while a movie can have many actors, one actor can have many movies. And ultimately, whether you want a schema like this or a schema like this is going to depend on how you're querying your database and what answers you're trying to get. Similar to the flexibility that MongoDB gives you when designing your schema, you have the same flexibility with regards to validating your schema. On one end, you can start inserting documents without any validation into your MongoDB database. However, you can also create schema validators that allow you to validate the structure and schema of a document before it's actually inserted into the database. With the release of MongoDB 3.6, you're now able to have complete schema validation through JSON schemas. So in the end, it's really a balance. With MongoDB, you can have very strict schemas or very loose schemas. But in a MongoDB world, people are generally more concerned about the performance of their queries, and therefore their schema will be dictated by those queries. 
after you figured out what your careers will look like, you can then start considering relationships in your data, which is the opposite of how we would do schema design in a relational world. But it's also very important to realize that schemas change over time. And this is because the queries you make to your database and your requirements of your projects change over time as well. And so therefore, your schemas change over time. And fortunately for you, MongoDB makes it very, very easy to change your schema. In this lesson, we are going to talk about how we can explore schemas. So there are a few ways that we could look at documents to identify our schema. One way would be just to query for the very first document in our collection. This will give you a good overview of this single document, but it's not going to give you an idea of the shape of all of your documents, assuming that they might look different. And moreover, it's not going to give you much information about the different fields or different data types on those other documents. One way to get around this would be to use the aggregation command. You could use the aggregation framework to tally up the different types and number of fields that you have across all your documents. But that's pretty cumbersome. The best way for you to look at your schema in MongoDB is with MongoDB Compass. Let's take a look at how it works. So this is the full version of MongoDB Compass. There are two versions of Compass. One is free and one is for people with an enterprise license. However, since you're a part of this course and you're using Compass for educational purposes, you are entitled to use the enterprise version of Compass free of charge. So here I've gone ahead and specified the different information necessary to connect to our course cluster. For password, I'm going to go ahead and type in ag-password. And I can go down here and click connect. And after a few moments, you can now see all the different collections that we have access to on the course cluster. Now that I'm connected, I've gone ahead and drilled down to this specific collection. And so you can see that Compass allows us to look at different collections and databases on our MongoDB database. But moreover, it allows us to easily view and explore documents. I can go ahead and look at this individual document and open up different array or object fields. I can really easily open up everything by clicking this button. But this is still just letting us look at our data one document at a time. If we go ahead and go over to the Schema tab and click Analyze Schema, by clicking Analyze, Compass is retrieving 1,000 random documents to be used to analyze the schema of this collection. As you may have guessed, the sampling is needed in order to provide a timely analysis. This is because if we wanted to read all of the documents from the collection, that could be many gigabytes or terabytes of data, which would not only be slow, but could potentially have negative effects on the server. For each field that was found in the sample documents, you can see not only the field's name, but when we drill down, we can also see its type. So this is embedded document, this embedded field is of type string, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Moreover, we're able to see the distribution of these types. So for example, this field is sometimes a document, but 17% of the time, at least for this sample of 1,000, it's actually undefined. This means that the field does not exist for those documents. This is a great way to help you analyze if you need to clean or transform the data in your database. Moreover, you can actually query your data. Here I select this range and it automatically generates a query. And now I can click Analyze and will only sample documents that meet the query criteria. And now that I've removed the outliers, you can see the distribution of the values from this sample. Additionally, Compass supports geospatial queries. Here you can see all the different geospatial points represented in these documents. And you can actually hold shift, click, and drag to create a geospatial query that will only find documents within that circle. So in summary, Compass makes it really easy for us to visualize the schemas and shape of our documents. It allows us to explore the distributions of our different fields. We can also write queries in Compass by either clicking and dragging on the different fields or writing queries ourselves. But I want to point out that I only covered a few of the features that Compass supports, specifically the ones focused on schema exploration. Compass has many, many more features that I highly recommend you dive into by playing around with the tool. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how we can migrate our schema using the aggregation framework. In a previous lesson, we saw how we can use Mongo import to import different data into MongoDB. Additionally, we saw how we can use some advanced functionality of Mongo import to specify the different types that we want each field to be. However, there are certain things that Mongo import does not support. For example, if we want to change the shapes of our documents 
when we're importing them, or if we want to add derived fields or calculated fields to our documents. Unfortunately, Mongo import does not support these types of transformations. However, have no fear because the aggregation framework fills in these gaps. The aggregation framework is going to help us change the shapes of our documents as well as add computed fields to our documents. For this lesson, we're going to start with the retail collection that we imported in a previous lesson using Mongo import. The documents look like the ones here to the left. Fortunately for us, we are already able to import these documents with the different data types that we want, which will save us from doing some additional work, like parsing a string into an integer or parsing a string into an ISO date. However, our application would perform much better if all documents reflected an entire invoice rather than each document representing one order of an invoice. So in order to produce this type of document, we're going to need to apply some type of transformation. So of course, as always, we're going to go ahead and import some dependencies. Here I'm going to create a little helper function that's going to make it a lot easier for us to print out our documents. And then I can go ahead and connect to my MongoDB free tier. And you'll notice that I'm using my free tier cluster instead of the course cluster on Atlas. And this is because during this exercise, we're actually going to be writing data to MongoDB, which is not allowed on the course cluster. Additionally, I also want to point out that this retail data set that we're using is actually not the same one that we use from the Mongo import lesson. This is only part of that data set. And the reason for this is that the free tier cluster does not allow us to spill the disk when we are applying transformations on lots and lots of data, unlike our paid Atlas cluster for the course. However, we still wanted you to be able to perform this exercise, so we've uploaded this reduced data set as a handout, and you can download this handout and import it and follow along. So here I'm going to go ahead and create an object to our reduced collection. And here's what the aggregation stage is going to look like in order for us to apply this transformation that we just talked about. What we really care to do is to put all the items that belong together under one invoice. And we're going to do that with the help of the dollar sign group stage. Note that we're not just grouping by invoice number, but also with customer ID and country. Knowing this data, we know that these fields should have the same value for a given invoice. However, I want to make sure and catch any issues if they are not. A little more on how we do this later in the lesson. As for invoice date, it is possible that an order could have been added onto an invoice, so we're going to go ahead and take the latest date. Alternatively, I could have built an array and accumulated all the different dates and made this field an array field. So that will give us the grouping that we want, but our document isn't going to have as nice of a shape as we would like. So to get around this, we're going to use project. This will allow us to move around some different fields and rename them accordingly. And here's where we go ahead and put these two stages together and execute it. And here we can take a peek at what one of these documents would look like. So now our order items are nice and embedded inside of an array field called items. For those familiar with relational databases, we basically took two tables associated by a one-to-in relationship and put the inside of the relationship inside an array field. Let's look at how we can add fields to these documents as well. Let's imagine that it's important for our application to prioritize large orders by dollar value. So in order to find those orders, we need to calculate the total value of the order. We can easily do this with an aggregation pipeline over our new documents. What we'd really like to do is multiply the unit price by the quantity for each item, and then sum all those up and add the as a field to the document. And here's a pipeline stage that will do that. Here we're having an add field stage where we name the field total price, and then using the reduce operator, we're able to map over the items array, setting the initial value of our reduce to zero dollar and zero cents, and then adding to that initial value the quantity multiplied by each unit price. And then it's as simple as adding that stage to our pipeline and looking at an example document. And now you can see for this document, we had 12 items at a unit price of $6.95, which comes to a total price of $83.40. Now that we have our documents the way that we want, the next thing we can do is go ahead and save this output to a new collection with the dollar sign out stage. And here I'm specifying that the new collection's name will be orders. It's important to note here that dollar sign out does not append or modify an existing collection, 
but rather will either create a collection if it does not exist or override a collection with these new results if it does exist. We can go ahead and create this stage and then execute our pipeline. And now the output of this pipeline, the transformation of the documents in the way that we want, are now saved to the orders collection. And so now we can very easily just go ahead and access this new orders collection, do a find one. And here you can see that we have the items array, and here you can see the total price. Now, earlier I said I wanted to, to verify that an invoice number was always going to be with the same customer ID and country. And we did this by grouping these three fields together. Now, if either of these two fields were not identical, we have gotten two documents with the same invoice number. Now, because underscore ID has to be unique within a collection, the server would fail to insert documents that had the same underscore ID. If this is not evident to you, you can actually move the invoice state into underscore ID into the grouping section. And then if we go ahead and add that stage and execute it, we now get a duplicate key error. Let's recap what we've learned. We saw how we could shape and enhance our documents by using the aggregation framework. We did see how the aggregation framework does not allow us to update documents in place, but rather replaces them with the dollars and out command. But we did see how we can use the dollars and out stage to create a new permanent collection of documents through the aggregation framework. Let's now discuss a powerful feature of MongoDB, views. MongoDB enables non-materialized views, meaning they are computed every time a read operation is performed against that view. They are a way to use an aggregation pipeline as a collection. From the user perspective, views are perceived as collections, with some key differences we'll go over later in the lesson. So what might views be useful for? Suppose we're a large financial institution with customers of different tiers. We've just recently launched a big promotion and are conducting a phone campaign. We've hired a temporary staffing agency with several regional offices. We'll assign a different tier to each regional office. This is a sample of one record from our customers collection. As we can see, there is sensitive and potentially biasing information that we do not want to allow access to. Views allow us to create vertical and horizontal slices of our collection. What do we mean by a horizontal and vertical slice? Vertical slicing is performed through the use of a project stage and other similar stages that change the shape of the document being returned. Here, we vertically sliced our document to only retain the account type field. Vertical slices will change the shape being returned, but not the number of documents being returned. Horizontal slicing is performed through the use of match stages. We select only a subset of documents based on some criteria. Here, we horizontally sliced our collection with the value of the account type. In fact, the documents that are grayed out would not be operated on at all by the following project stage. We could further slice this data horizontally by only selecting accounts that had a specified minimum balance and are within a desired age range, and you get the idea. It may even be necessary to use an intermediary shaping stage to calculate a value that we wish to filter documents on. Horizontal slices will affect the number of documents returned, not their shape. Let's look at another example of this with documents that have the following schema. We'd like to vertically slice the documents to remove sensitive information as well as make the name and gender information available, but present it in a more formal format for the call center employees. We'd also like to horizontally slice our collection by filtering out documents that do not have an account type of bronze. Here's an example, creating a view that performs both horizontal and vertical slicing. To make data available for the call center, we're going to assign bronze tier members. We specify the name of the view, the source collection, and then the pipeline that will get stored to compute this view. Within the pipeline, we perform our initial horizontal slice with a match stage, selecting only bronze tier members. Then, within the project stage, we perform our vertical slicing, retaining the fields we want and reassigning the name field with a more formally formatted name. You can see this view in action yourself. Let's run the command to get collection information for the current database. Here, we see information about every collection. 
I've already created three views, bronze banking, silver banking, and gold banking. We can see they show up just like collections, except their type is view. And in the options, we can see the view that they are on and the pipeline that defines them. You won't be able to create views on the Class Atlas cluster. If you'd like to see these views in action and how restrictive they can be along with proper role-based access control, the login credentials are contained in the handout in this lesson. If you'd like to learn more about role-based access control, refer to our security course, which is linked below this video. Views can be created in two different ways. We have the shell helper method, db.createView, which we already saw, and the create collection method here. A view consists in a name, a source collection, an aggregation pipeline, and if required, a specific collation. In essence, when we call a view, we will be executing the aggregation pipeline that is used to define the view. View meta information to include the pipeline that computes the view is stored in the system.views collection. Let's look at this information. Again, we can see the same information we saw before with the get collection infos command, but now only for our views. Hopefully, this illustrates that the only information stored about a view is the name, the source collection, the pipeline that defines it, and optionally, the collation. All collection read operations are available as views, and yes, we can perform aggregations on views too. Views do have some restrictions. No write operations. Views are read-only and computed when we issue a read operation against them. They are a reflection of the defined aggregation on the source collection. No index operations. Since views use the source collection to get their data, the index operations need to be performed on that source collection. Views will use the source collection's indexes during their creation. No renaming. View names are immutable, so they cannot be renamed. That said, we can always drop a view and create it again with a new pipeline without affecting I.O. of the server. No dollar text. The text query operator can only be used in the first stage of an aggregation pipeline, and a view will execute the defined pipeline first. This query operator cannot be used in a view. No GeoNear or the GeoNear stage. Same as with text, GeoNear is required to be the first stage of our pipeline. Collation restrictions. Views have collation restrictions, such as views do not inherit the default collation of the source collection as specified. There are other collation-specific concerns which you can read about by following the link below this video. Lastly, find operations where the following projection operators are not permitted. Removing and retaining fields is allowed, but trying to use any of these operators will fail. View definitions are public. Any role that can list collections on a database can see a view definition as we saw earlier. Avoid referring to sensitive information within the defining pipeline. All right, that sums up views. Here are a few things to remember. Views contain no data themselves. They are created on demand and reflect the data in the source collection. Views are read-only. Write operations to views will error. Views have some restrictions. They must abide by the rules of the aggregation framework and cannot contain find projection operators. Horizontal slicing is performed with the match stage, reducing the number of documents that are returned. Vertical slicing is performed with a project or other shaping stage, modifying individual documents. In this lesson, we're going to discuss how we can supplement schemas by using different accumulator operators. And specifically, we're going to look at how we can enhance our documents by adding different calculated fields to them. And then by adding those calculated fields, we'll see kind of the usefulness that that provides us when we want to perform some additional analysis. So here, like always, I'm going to go ahead and import PyMongo and go ahead and connect to our Atlas cluster. We're going to first use the orders collection. And just to remind you what this looks like, here's an example document. And you can see here that we have this a purchase array where we have these different individual items that were purchased. Now there's some information that's embedded in this document, just this one single document, that might be useful to us if we had access to it very easily via a field. 
maybe, for example, we'd want to know the total quantity for an order. So we knew like how many different products um, people were buying when they placed an order with us. Or maybe we really care about knowing how many separate items they were purchasing. So not how many total items they were purchasing, but rather how many separate unique items they were purchasing. And we can actually go ahead and add this information to every document in the collection by using add fields. And then very simply, we can say the name of the field that we want, in this case, total quantity. And then we're able to use a uh, accumulator, rather than using the accumulator at the collection level across multiple documents, we can use the accumulator on one single document when it's specified inside the add field stage. So we can go ahead and add up all of the items in the purchases array field on the embedded field quantity and put them all together and sum them up into this total quantity field. Similarly, we can figure out how many total uh, distinct items were purchased by just using the size operator on the purchases array. And then here at the end, I'm limiting to one just so we can see what this looks like for that same exact document. And as you can see, we had the same document that we had before, but now we have this num items, which says three because there are one, two, three items. And then we also have this total quantity field, which tells us that there are 236 um, things purchased. And that's because that's 36 plus 100 plus 100. But we can also do more complex things. Here I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the employees collection. And in the employees collection, what we have going on is you can see that we have basically a document describing an employee. And one of the fields is employee compensation, which contains all this interesting information. And the two of the fields in here that are particularly interesting are salary and stock award. And these are both cash and cash equivalents, um, because let's assume this is a publicly traded company, that make up the employee's total compensation for a year. And so maybe we'd want to add a field called total compensation. So we have underneath the employee compensation embedded document, we could add a field called total, where we just use the aggregation sum operator, and we pass in both the employee's uh, salary, as well as the employee's stock award, sum those two together. Again, we're using limit to look at the same document. And very easily, you can see that now we have a total field inside of employee compensation that is really just the sum of these two numbers. And while by itself, adding fields like this aren't necessarily very valuable by themselves, the real value comes from when you combine them with additional aggregation operators. For example, here I'm using a group stage. So I'm first able to go ahead and figure out the total compensation for every employee. And then I'm able to pass that to group and I'm not grouping on any specific field, rather I'm grouping on the entire collection. And now I'm able to find the average total compensation for all employees, which we can see is $132,903 and 42 cents and three tenths of a cent. And this is where the real power of adding accumulators into your aggregation pipelines to enhance your schemas. So in summary, we were able to see how we were able to add calculated fields to enhance documents by using add fields. You can also do it using project and then using accumulator operators that you would normally use against an entire collection on just fields that are a part of a single document. And then by creating those calculated fields, we really are able to perform a lot more useful analysis because we're able to utilize those fields in aggregate across all documents to get aggregated calculated values. In this lesson, we're going to talk about working with tree-like data that's represented in documents stored in MongoDB. And specifically, we're going to look at how we can deal with simple trees that have one-way links. And then we're going to see some of the problems with that. And then we're going to see how we can use the aggregation framework to transform these singly linked trees into complex trees. And then we can see some of the benefits um, that we have with doubly linked trees for performing complex analysis. And while this lesson is on trees, in reality, this lesson is on how to use graph lookup in a practical way so you can apply it for recursive data structures like trees. Okay, first we're going to do some setup. Here we're going to go ahead and make sure we have the right dependencies installed and imported. And then we're going to connect to our MongoDB Atlas cluster. And here we'll be using the product categories collection. 
which is a data set full of product categories that's akin to large online retailers. Here we're going to go ahead and issue a basic query where we look for all the product categories that contain the word cat. We're going to use a regex to perform this. We're then going to go ahead and return all these results and shove them into a data frame so we can look at our data. And here are a whole bunch of other categories which are, all have the parent of cat supplies. I'm going to go ahead and use an open source library here called ETE3 for visualizing this tree. This content of this cell doesn't really matter that much. It's just so that we can go ahead and see how this tree looks. And while this does have some tree-like characteristics, there's a problem here, which is that every node is a leaf node, reports directly up to a different uh, parent category, and then there isn't really a root node here. And so to kind of better illustrate this, here's what we would like it to look like. Where here we have all of our leaf categories um, funneling up to cat supplies, and then cat supplies funnels up to um, its parent, pet supplies. And so today we're going to try to use graph lookup to model our data in this way, and moreover, not only add these parental links, we're also going to try to add child links so that we can do some more interesting analysis with this data. And so like I said before, this is really an excellent use case for graph lookup. So here I'm going to go ahead and look for the product category um, cat toys. And then starting with cat toys, it, its name, I'm going to look for documents whose parent has that name. And then recursively just fetch those documents' names and uh, connect on documents whose parent field matches those names. And we'll call all those documents ancestors because we're basically building out the ancestry graph here, right? And we're just going to continue doing this until we have no parent. When we execute this and print it out, you can see that's pretty much what we get. Here we start with cat toys. Um, we then have cat toys, which is kind of annoying, and we'll look at how to get rid of that in a second. But then we can see that cat toys' parent is cat supplies, which is right here, whose parent is pet supplies, which is right here, whose parent is animal and pet supplies, which is right here. And then we end there because that has no parent. So we now have all of the parent documents. So from here, we should be able to fill out the rest of the tree. But before we can do that, we first need to go ahead and remove this duplicate document right here that's really referring to the same thing. And we can achieve that by using the set difference operator. And here we're going to remove nodes where the parent matches either its name or none in the case where the parent is actually the root ancestor and the parent field is null. And when we execute this and print it out, and here you can see we have cat toys whose parent is cat supplies, and we have all of cat toys ancestors with animal and pet supplies, pet supplies, and cat supplies. But we want to go ahead and keep that parental information, but moreover we want to go ahead and try and calculate all of these nodes' children. So we can really have a doubly linked tree. So to do this, we're first going to go ahead and start with unwinding that array field. And here we go. And one thing you'll notice now is that every entry in Ancestors is an ancestor of cat toys. And these have been separated out into separate documents. So now we can go ahead and try and group by ancestors.name on these different ancestor categories to go ahead and build out a descendant graph for every item. Here we're going to go ahead and group by every ancestor, and then we're going to go ahead and add the original root node's name to its list of descendants. And it works. Great. Let's go ahead and now do the same thing, but on our original query where we looked for any category containing the word cat. We're also going to look for the pet supplies category by adding a match stage at the end because we know that pet supplies is an ancestor of cat supplies. And we're also going to maintain that parental information so that we can use that later to construct a list of immediate children for each node. And you'll see that in just a moment. Great, it nearly works. We now have a small issue where we can see that the node's name is duplicated in its list of descendants. But we can fix that, and we already know how to do that by using a set difference expression. And so we're going to go ahead and use set difference again now on the underscore ID field because we use group by. And then we're going to go ahead and difference that against its descendants where it has the same name. We're going to also add a field called children 
where we're going to look for any immediate children of a node, and we're just going to filter over this descendants array for items where the parent is equal to the name of the node that we're on. And this should give us all of our immediate children. And before executing this pipeline, we're going to make a copy of it so that we can use it again later. And then so on this copy, we're going to go ahead and add our match at the beginning and at the end, like before. And here you go. Now we have cat toys, which has no descendants because it's a leaf node. Um, same thing with cat litter boxes. And so with cat supplies, we're going to see all of its descendants. All of its descendants are also all of its children. But then when we look at pet supplies, we're going to see all of its descendants, including leaf nodes like cat toys. But then in its immediate children, we're just going to see cat supplies because that's its only immediate child. Here I've written a function to descend the graph from any node and generate the appropriate string to visualize the tree. So now we can see if the tree looks like the way we described that we want it to at the beginning of the lesson. And we can see that now it does, which is awesome. Now, in inverting the tree to get it looking this way, we destroyed those parental references. And so let's go ahead and now build a pipeline where we go ahead and get those back. We're just going to go ahead and do a simple set difference on the ancestor's parent against its name. I'm calling that ancestors and also keeping its original parent. And now we can go ahead and take our pipeline that inverts our tree and our pipeline that keeps our parents, and we can run them in parallel using facet. We'll then unwind our parent tree and pair up document entries in the child tree output by name. And then the rest here is really just extracting the different important pieces of the child tree that we care about and assigning it to the top level document. And then cleaning up the output a little bit. And then, of course, sorting so we can have a better visualization. And we're sorting by the number of descendants. And here is really the key part. Here we're now able to calculate some really interesting heuristics, like the number of children, the total number of descendants, and the total number of ancestors. And calculating this information before would have been impossible without first inverting the tree using graph lookup. Excellent. And now you can see we have a truly doubly linked tree structure where each node has parental information if it has it as well as any ancestor information, as well as immediate children, and finally a list of all of its descendants. And then moreover, we're able to now calculate all these interesting statistics, like the number of ancestors, number of children, and number of descendants. Let's go ahead and see what this tree actually looks like. And here you can see a slightly different view of the entire product tree, beginning with pet supplies. Now having the tree represented in this way is very advantageous. Instead of having to crawl the tree one node at a time, we can take shortcuts to determine information such as if one item is an ancestor or descendant of another. Also, because the parent and children information is here, we can find common ancestors of two elements if there is one. And here's a basic example for how we can perform some interesting analysis. Here I'm creating functions to determine is descendant, is ancestor, or is common ancestor. And here we can see if Burgecade Food and Water Dishes is a descendant of Pet Supplies, which it is. Here we can see if Pet Supplies is an ancestor of Burgecade Accessories, which it is. And here we can see if Small Animal Food and Pet Food Containers have a common ancestor, which they do, and it is Pet Supplies. Answering questions like this would have been very, very difficult with the way that our data was modeled before. And now we're able to use graph lookup to model our data in a way where we can easily answer these questions. Now, for example, imagine if we paired this information with transactional information. We'd be able to easily identify categories that could be removed in an effort to streamline business. We can also use this type of structure for recommendation. If a customer is buying a product in the cat toys category, we may recommend products from other categories under the parent cat supplies. Without a common ancestor and without the full ancestry or descendant information, doing this in a timely manner would be infeasible. Lastly, I wanted to give you the ability to see the entire product tree. We're not going to display this here because there's over 17,000 entries in this collection and the image is very, very large. Feel free to uncomment on the last line in the cell to render the image and open it in an external image viewer with really good zoom capabilities. But beware, this image is very, very large.
Okay, we covered a lot of information in this lesson, so let's discuss what we've learned. We learned how to work with simple trees, and we saw how simple trees often don't contain enough information for efficient traversal, which makes them harder to work with when trying to explore relationships. We also saw how we can transform these simple singly linked trees into more complex doubly linked trees using graph lookup. Moreover, we saw how we could combine two graph lookup stages in a facet to invert a bottom-up tree into a top-down tree and then combine the two. And you saw the advantages of these more complex trees with double links. We had much better entity relationship descriptions. We were able to do much faster traversal. Do keep in mind that complex trees use up slightly more space because of that richer entity relationship information. And that's the lesson on tree-like data with MongoDB. MongoDB 3.6 brings powerful addition to the aggregation framework called Expressive Lookup. Lookup has this new additional form that allows for inner joins, while additionally allowing us to be more expressive, thus simplifying our pipelines. Expressive Lookup has the following form. The arguments are from, let, pipeline, and as. Let is the only optional field. From is a collection we want to look at from. It is identical to the simple lookup form. Let allows us to bind variables to use in the next argument. Again, let is optional. If omitted, the pipeline is considered uncorrelated, meaning the results will not be determined based on any information from the working document. Pipeline allows us to specify logic as well as shape the return document. It executes on the collection we specify to from. We'll cover this more in a moment. As is where we specify the name of the field we want the results of the lookup assigned. It is identical to the simple lookup form. We'll refer to documents from the source collection that we're aggregating over as the working documents. From is still a required parameter for this form and works exactly as it did, specifying the collection we want to look up documents from. Here, we will again specify Air Airlines as the from field. Let allows us to bind variables from the working document to variable names we can define for use in the next argument. Here, we'll assign the value of our Airlines array to a variable called constituents. Note the use of the field path expression when assigning this value. If this is unfamiliar, Variables can be assigned exactly as they are in the dollar let expression when declaring bars. Remember though, it's not the same format as in the dollar let expression, rather just name expression pairs. A link to the dollar let expression documentation as well as expression operators is below. Pipeline is where the power of the new expressive lookup comes to full force. Using the new $EXPR expression, we can use aggregation operators where we would normally use query operators. To access the defined variables in let, we prepend two dollar signs, just as we would to access user-defined variables. One dollar sign is still a normal field path expression and will refer to that value within the document. Here, Name in the pipeline refers to the name field in the current document in the looked up collection. Again, this subpipeline is executed on the Air Alliances collection since we specified it as the argument to from. This pipeline is a fully featured pipeline with all the power and expressiveness the aggregation framework provides. Here, dollar dollar constituents is referring to the constituents variable we created in let. We bound the value of the airlines array to the name constituents. So we will filter out documents where the name of the airline isn't in constituents. And just like the simple form of lookup, as is the field name we want to have the results of the lookup assigned to. Just as the previous lookup, it will be an array of matches or an empty array if there were no matches. Also, just as in the simple form, it will return the entirety of the matching document by default. Let's look at this in action. As the argument to from, we specify Air Airlines. In let, we bound the airlines array to the name constituents, which we refer to in the pipeline, where we filter out documents where the name isn't in constituents. Let's run it to see the results. 
Now let's look at the previous example where we only wanted the ID of the airline, name, and alias. We used an add field stays to transform the airlines array, extracting the name, alias, and information from airline, assigning that one to a key called ID. And just the name, alias, and ID within the airlines array. Using the new expressive lookup form, we still specified Air Airlines to from. We bound the information from the airlines array to a field called constituents that we can use within our pipeline. And in our pipeline, we've just added a project stage where we remove the underscore ID information, project the name, alias, and reassign the airline field to the key ID. And we got the content we wanted, and the shaping was done before joining, so we ultimately used less space to accomplish the same task. You are probably beginning to understand the powerful possibilities available with the new expressive form of lookup. Let's summarize what we've covered so far. The pipeline in expressive lookup is a fully qualified aggregation pipeline and subject to the same restrictions. Operates over the collection specified to the from field. Accesses variables bound and let by perpending two dollar signs and will execute for every working document. This add field stage that transforms the airlines field, iterating over the airlines collection, extracting the name, alias, and airline info, and reassigning the airline to a new key called ID. Let's see the results. Great, it worked as expected. We can see we transformed the documents within the airlines array after the lookup stage returned them. Exactly what we wanted, but let's look at a better way. This is where the new expressive lookup form comes in. Now that we've covered the basics of the new expressive lookup, let's look at a slightly more in-depth example. Currently, the Air Airlines collection isn't quite right. Not all of the names for the member airlines are the actual names. For example, KLM is actually KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. So in Air Alliances, where we issue this find one query, we can see that KLM is in the airlines array. However, when we query our Air Airlines collection for KLM, it looks like the IATA information was used instead of the name when constructing our Air Alliances collection. As an aside, this is the code assigned by the International Air Transport Association. So, how do we find the incorrect names? With the new expressive lookup, it should be pretty easy. Since we can now bind variables to use in a pipeline and that pipeline executes over the looked up collection, we can check to see if the name the airline in the Air Alliances collection matches either the name, alias, IATA, or ICAO values in the documents in the Air Airlines collection. Okay, let's start with this. To from, I'm specifying Air Airlines. In let, I'm binding the value of the Airlines field from the document in Air Alliances to a key called maybe name. In pipeline, I'm simply matching to see if maybe name is in name, alias, IATA, or IACO. Hmm. The found field is an empty array. That definitely doesn't seem right. Let's look at the pipeline again. Ah, okay, there's the mistake. Since I'm comparing two arrays, the dollar in operator won't do the trick. Instead, I'll make sure the size of the intersection of both arrays is greater than zero, meaning at least one element with the same in both. So here, I'm using the size expression to get the size of the intersection between these two arrays and ensuring that that value is greater than zero. All right, I'm getting results in the found array now, but it's a bit crowded. Let's trim it down so I only get the information I want. Specifically, I want the name the airline should be. Okay, we have the same internal pipeline as below so far. With the addition of this project stage, where I shape the return document to my needs. I just want what the name is and the name we referred to it by. 
To do that, I filter the maybe name variable, which is the airlines array from the Air Alliances collection, to get the isolated value by using array element zero. After this filter, all entries would be identical, but zero guarantees that we'll get at least one value. Okay, we're getting closer to our goal. We can see that the referred name was KLM, but the name is KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. Let's do a quick sanity check to make sure we're finding all the member airlines of our alliances. Okay, I have the same structure and syntax as before with the addition of this match stage, where I specify this expression, checking to see if the size of the airlines array does not equal the size of the found array meaning we didn't find all member airlines. Okay, scrolling up through it, I see one document, two documents, and three documents. So that means that not only are we referring to the airlines with the wrong name, we may have misspellings as well. So let's see which ones need updating and which ones we didn't find. All right. I've added a final project stage. I'll get rid of the underscore ID, retain the name of the alliance, and display which airlines I didn't find and which ones need updating. Great. Easy to read results, and I can see there are some minor typos, such as here and here. Scrolling down, I can also see names that need updating. KLM to KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, and Taram to Taram. This is an excellent starting point to fixing errors in our data. Okay, let's summarize. As we saw, we are free to use nearly any aggregation stage and expression within the subpipeline of a lookup stage, with the only restrictions being those that are already in place for any pipeline. Remember, the subpipeline in lookup executes in the context of the collection we are looking up. So, throughout this lesson, the subpipeline was executing in the context of the Air Airlines collection. Using the new syntax to perform calculations and transformations within the subpipeline and combining with calculations and transformations on the main pipeline allow for simplified operations that previously would be much more complicated, if not impossible. Welcome to week three. So far, you learned how to use the powerful aggregation framework to shape and analyze your data, the importance of schema design, and how to effectively explore your data, and how to migrate your data for storage and practical use. I'm very excited for the content in week three. This week, we'll be putting our knowledge to practical use and using data from MongoDB to build simple machine learning models. We'll use Python libraries including NumPy, Pandas, ML Extend and Scikit-Learn to work with our data, asking questions and making predictions, and using Matplotlib and Seaborn for visualizations. We'll explore Pearson correlation, principal component analysis, linear regression, market basket analysis, clustering with k-means, and decision trees. The work this week will use MongoDB in the role of a data store, where we'll be cleaning and transforming that data prior to feeding it into a model. MongoDB isn't a machine learning engine, but it certainly won't get in the way of our efforts, and in fact, aggregation can make things much easier. So the purpose of this week is to show how easy it is to work with data from MongoDB. Now, we won't dive into tuning hyperparameters or discuss the artful side of data science, otherwise this week could easily turn into a year or more. Again, welcome to week three. We hope you have fun during this content, and if you are new to data science, we hope to inspire you to dig further on your own. Best of luck. In this lesson, we're going to talk about Pearson correlation, which is oftentimes referred to as Pearson's R, Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, or the bivariate correlation. And it's a way to determine the correlation between bivariate data, which means data that has two variables. But what is correlation? Well, correlation is a linear relationship, or lack thereof, between two variables, and Pearson's R is a measure of the strength of that linear correlation. So we have a nice little graph here to show you some different values for Pearson's correlation. Pearson's R can be between negative one and one inclusive. So a negative value 
implies that there's a negative correlation between the two variables. If there's a positive value for Pearson's R, then there's a positive correlation. And then a Pearson's R value of zero means that there is no correlation between the data points. So here we have a perfect correlation of negative one. Here we have a perfect positive correlation of positive one. And here we have a negative correlation that's not perfect. Here we have a positive correlation that's not perfect. And then here it's very clear that these set of data points have no correlation whatsoever. Okay, now that we have an understanding of what correlation is, let's use some real data. We're going to scroll down here and we're going to install some dependencies. But then we're going to go ahead and connect to our MongoDB Atlas cluster. And we're going to go ahead and use the movies data set. And specifically, we're going to be building a pipeline here that's going to be looking for movie ratings and movie votes for those ratings. And we're going to try to determine if there is a correlation between the number of votes and the actual rating that a movie has. So in this pipeline, we're going to use a match stage to make sure that we're getting documents that have both non-zero values for ratings and votes. And then we're going to go ahead and use the project stage to remove underscore ID and keep the two values that we care about. And we're going to go ahead and rename them to rating and votes. Once we have our pipeline, we can go ahead and pass it to the aggregate command and then turn it into a list. And then from that list, we can go ahead and turn it into a data frame by using the from dict function. And now that we're in our pandas data frame, we can go ahead and take a peek at our data. And as you can see, we now have our, our data in our data frame. And from here, we can go ahead and use Seaborn's join plot method to visualize the entirety of our results. And it's also going to go ahead and fit a regression line on our results as well. And there we go. And it looks like we do have some correlation. You can see we have a Pearson's R value of 0.15. And we can see that, moreover, just by looking at the data without looking at the line of best fit, we can see that as a movie's rating increases, so does the number of votes. So there seems to be a positive correlation, even though it's a tiny positive correlation, between the rating of a movie and the number of votes that it received. But let's go ahead and calculate Pearson's R by hand. And this is the formula for doing a single pass calculation of Pearson correlation by hand. There's also a multi-pass form, but we're not going to cover that in this lesson because the single pass can actually be done in aggregation. We're first going to go ahead and do this calculation in Python. And then after we've seen how it's done in Python, we're then going to go ahead and see how it can be done in aggregation. So there's a bit of groundwork that needs to be done before we can go ahead and calculate Pearson's R. Basically, we're going to go ahead and go through here and find each of these terms. Within for every value of S, we're going to go ahead and subtract the mean from it. We're going to do the same thing for y. And then for these pairs of values, we're going to go ahead and multiply them together. And then we're going to go ahead and use those differentials again from above. And we'll calculate their square. And then once we have all these different values, we can use them together to kind of create this formula. The first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and make a copy of our original data frame. I'm going to call it exm. As you can see, our data is still there. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the mean of x and the mean of y. So it's as simple as taking the sum and dividing by the total number. We're going to store these in m underscore x and m underscore y. And then you can see our mean for x is 6.3. So our average rating for a movie is 6.3. And then we have the mean for y, which would be our average number of votes, which is about 11,700. We can now go ahead and calculate little x, little y, as well as x, y, and x x squared and y squared. So here we're going to go ahead and map over all the values of x, subtracting the mean. We'll do the same thing for y. We're then going to zip up our ratings and votes together and map over them and then multiply every pair together. We're going to call that x, y. We're then going to square every value for x and y by mapping over all of those values. And then we have x, y, x, y, x squared and y squared. And then we're going to go ahead and assign all these values into our data frame. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what that looks like. And as you can see, we now have a nice little data frame where we have our original ratings, our original votes. And then for every one, we have an x value, a y value, an xy, an x squared, and a y squared. 
now that we have our data frame, we can go ahead and dive into the equation itself. First, we're just going to focus on the numerator. We're going to call this top. We're going to begin by multiplying the number of elements, which we got up here, by the sum of all of those xy multiples right here. So we're just going to multiply those two together, and now we have the product of those two stored in this variable. Next, we're going to go ahead and sum up all of the um, x values and y values, so all of the ratings and all the votes. Multiply those two guys together, store that in that variable. And then finally, we're just going to take the difference between those two, and we're going to call that top. And that's a very large number. Now let's go ahead and focus on the bottom part of our equation. And for the moment, we're going to ignore the square roots, and we're also going to divide it into a, a left part and a right part. So here we're focusing on the left part, and first, we're going to multiply the number of elements by the sum of the squares. We're going to call that proc sum x2 elements. And then we'll go ahead and subtract the sum of the squares of x, or ratings, from that. And that will be our bottom left. We can now go ahead and focus on the right-hand part of our denominator. And this is very similar to the left-hand side, but now we're concerned with y instead of x. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to multiply the number of elements by the sum of the squares of y, and we're then going to take that and subtract the sums of the y squareds from that. And we're going to shortcut here, and now we're just going to take the square root of the bottom left times the bottom right, and that'll be our denominator. And then finding Pearson's r is as simple as dividing the top by the bottom, and we get 0.1464. Let's go ahead and compare this with the Pearson r library from SciPy. And as you can see, we get the same number, which moreover is actually 0.146, the same as the 0.15 with some rounding that we got with Seaborn. Both methods work, both doing it in Seaborn and both doing it by hand both work, but they're both being done in Python, which is slower than it needs to be. Not only is it slow, but we're also transmitting a lot of data from MongoDB and sending it here to the client. All that data could just be processed directly on our MongoDB cluster, reducing the need for transferring data and doing this analysis in Python. To remedy this, we're going to use MongoDB's aggregation framework. Let's see how. First thing first, we're going to go ahead and create aliases for our two values, x and y, just so we're speaking in the same terms as before. And then just like before, we're going to go ahead and figure out the number of elements we have. We're going to sum up the x's, sum up the y's, sum up the squares of x and y, and sum up the multiples of x and y. We're going to go ahead and insert these into a group stage and assign it to a variable called all sums. Next, we're going to go ahead and assemble the top part of the equation. Aside from using aggregation syntax, it's identical to what we did above. And similarly for the denominator, assembling the left and right side is exactly the same as what we did above, but now just in aggregation. And like before, it's as sim assembling our bottom is as simple as multiplying the left and right together and taking the square root. We're then going to go ahead and project out the correlation, calling it m, just by dividing the top by the bottom. We can now go ahead and assemble all of our stages together. We're going to go ahead and do a match like before. We're going to go ahead and get all of our sums and finally calculate our correlation. Now that we've assembled our pipeline, we can go ahead and execute it by using the aggregate command. And we're going to go ahead and compare it against the other values that we've calculated. And great, we got the same results for all three variables. The major difference here is that we didn't need to marshal any data into a data frame, and we were able to have the entire data set be executed server-side with MongoDB. And that's how we calculate Pearson correlation in MongoDB. In this lesson, we're going to discuss associative rules for performing a market basket analysis, commonly abbreviated MBA. So to perform this market basket analysis, we're going to look at how we can determine which items are frequently purchased together using the a priori algorithm. And through that, we're going to see how to determine associative rules. And moreover, we're going to define some important terms like support, confidence, and lift. All interesting things have a great story, and so we'll start off with one. You may or may not be familiar with the beer and diaper story, but here it goes. So a store decided to do a formal analysis on their data and found that men between the ages of 30 and 40, while shopping between the hours of 5 and 7 p.m. on Fridays, were considerably more likely to purchase beer if they already had diapers in their cart. 
Armed with this knowledge, the store relocated the beer section closer to the diaper section and saw an increase in sales of both by 35%. While a great story, unfortunately, is not true. The true story is that there is a company called Osco Drug, which examined 1.2 million transactions across 25 stores and identified around 5,000 slow-moving items, and then they removed them. And the result was really quite measurable. By removing that inventory, it made it easier for customers to find what they wanted, and customers thought selection had increased. So therefore, their sales increased, and the company saved money by reducing their inventory overhead. But let's see how we can perform a real market basket analysis. So we're going to go ahead and install some dependencies, go ahead and import those dependencies, and before we get into the a priori algorithm and associative rules, first we need to talk about how we need to model our data. Let's imagine that we have a super small store that only sells five items. We sell beer, chips, salsa, chocolate, and diapers. Here we have a schema that lists all of our transactions where each entry is a customer's shopping cart and each entry inside of their shopping cart, we say what they bought and then how many of those items they bought. So it's very easy for us to go ahead and take this variable and put it into a data frame. And you can see right here, that's what this data looks like in a tabular format. Okay, so we have this transaction table, but in order to build association rules, the first thing we need to do is get rid of all these NAN values, all these not a number values. Fortunately for us, we can just use pandas built-in fill NA function and replace all those NAs with zeros. Now that all of our data is numerical, now we need to one-hot encode our data. And that simply means that we need to represent whether something was present or not. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to go through all the different values, and if anything is greater than zero, we're just going to set it to one. And there we go. Now our data demonstrates whether or not someone purchased something. Keep in mind that one-hot encoding something like a trait can be a little bit more tricky. So for example, if we had gender, let's say your gender was restricted to just male and female, and we represented that binarily with one or zero. In order to one-hot encode that, we'd really need to create two separate columns, one for female and one for male, and then represent it like so, because we're really trying to represent the presence or lack of presence for some feature. Great, now that we know what our data needs to look like, let's define some terms and then look at a little bit of the math for market basket analysis. With association rules, when we define relationships, we use the terms antecedent and consequence. And then we also have some characteristic terms like support, confidence, and lift. When we define a rule, we say that something implies something else. So A implies B. And this cool little arrow actually means implies. So when we have a rule that says chips implies beer, we say that chips is the antecedent and beer is the consequent. And these are the two terms for defining the relationships in an association rule. Support is the first term we're going to use to describe the characteristics of a relationship. And support is just the occurrence of an item among all transactions. So for example, there are five occurrences of chips in all six transactions. Chips would have a 0.833 support. And beer appears four times across six transactions, so it would have a support of 0.667. And we would do this for every single combination of items, referred to commonly as item sets. So we'd start with all item sets of one, all item sets of two, all item sets of three, etc. Now when you do this, you typically define some kind of minimum amount of support to avoid exploring extremely uncommon pairings. In this example, I've limited the minimum threshold to 0.5. The next term is confidence. And confidence is the likelihood that some item set, B, will be bought together with an item set, A. It is calculated by dividing the support of item set, A, B, by item set, A. So the confidence that the antecedent chips implies the consequent beer is 60% because the support for chips and beer is 0.5 and the support for chips by itself is 0.833. Divide them and you get 
So 60% of the time that chips were bought, beer was also bought. Now confidence can be a very good indicator, but it also has a major drawback. If the consequent is popular, then confidence does not take this into account and can lead to an implication where there really isn't any. And the last characteristic we're going to look at is lift. And lift is how likely an item set B was purchased when item set A was purchased. So unlike confidence, lift takes into account the popularity of item set B and is calculated by dividing the support of item set AB by the product of the support of item set A by the support of item set B. So the lift for the rule chips implies beer would be 0.9. Now lift values of 1 imply no association. Values greater than 1 imply a positive association, and values less than 1 imply a negative association. Now that we have these terms defined, let's go ahead and look back at the code. To calculate these different values, we're going to use two different methods from the ML Extended Machine Learning Library. We're going to use the a priori method and the association rules method. First, we're going to build our associations with the a priori method. And as you can see, I'm min I am setting my minimum threshold for support to 0.5. Now keep in mind, as the data set gets larger, you may need to decrease this threshold. And as you can see, here are different item sets with their different support values. And now we can pass those associations to the association rules method. Here I'm using a minimum threshold of 0.5. In reality, we'd want something probably uh, greater than 1, but I'm doing this so that we can see all of the associations. And here you can see our different association rules. We have our different antecedent item sets and our different consequent item sets with their support, confidence, and lift. Moreover, you can see that our diaper and beer story is true for this data set. And you can also see that chips implies beer with a lift of 0.9, just like when we calculated it manually earlier. OK, now that we understand the basics of association rules, let's go ahead and do the same thing with a much larger data set. First, we're going to connect to our cluster with PyMongo. And in this data set, we have documents like this, where we have a purchases array with embedded documents describing each purchase. And we really want to convert this into a format like this, where we just have every product ID, or I guess this is a stock ID, and then whether or not someone purchased something. To do this, we're going to use our replace root stage by mapping over all of the different object keys and just turning them to one for every stock code. And that's going to be our only stage in our pipeline. And then very simply, we can go ahead and exhaust that cursor and shove it into a data frame. And like before, we have a bunch of not a number values. So again, we're going to go ahead and use the fill in a data frame function. And here we're replacing all those NAs with zero. And now, like before, we can go ahead and use the a priori function. Now, notice I have a much lower minimum support. And that's because we have a little over 3,600 different stock codes among our data set. So we'll go ahead and get those associations. And we'll go ahead and look at them. And here are all the different support values for all the different item sets. And then we can go ahead and, like before, pass these associations to the association rules function. Here I'm giving a minimum threshold of 3. This time we don't want to look at every possible rule. We really only want to look at the strongest rules. And now we can go ahead and print them out. Our very top rule with a lift of 24.22 says that stock codes 22698 alongside 22699 are frequently purchased with 22697. We can go ahead and create an, a simple aggregation pipeline to see what these products were. And it makes sense. Um, people were buying teacups and saucers of different colors together. So knowing this information, maybe we'd want to go ahead and package these items together in our store. OK, let's summarize what we've learned. We saw how market basket analysis work by using the a priori algorithm. We saw how to get that data out of MongoDB so we could pass it into the appropriate functions. And moreover, we saw the different terms for these associative rules and what these different terms meant and how each of these terms were calculated. In this lesson, we're going to talk about principal component analysis, commonly referred to as PCA. And specifically, we're going to see what PCA is used for. And then moreover, we're going to get into the weeds of how it's performed using Python. With big data, it's not uncommon to have many different dimensions to your data. 
And with all these dimensions, it can make it hard to process your data for analysis if you have many, many records. But moreover, it's actually pretty impossible to visualize all these dimensions at once. So I'm going to walk through a visualization of how we can use PCA to reduce the dimensionality of our data. And now while this example is only in two dimensions, it's really important that you remember that PCA can be performed on any number of dimensions. And this is where PCA really derives its power. So given an A data matrix that has two dimensions, we can go ahead and compute an eigenvector that accounts for the most variance in our data. And we'll call this PC1, or principal component 1. And now it's not super important that you understand what an eigenvector is, but just understand that it's being used to demonstrate the direction and magnitude of where we have the most variance in our data. Now that we have PC1, we can go ahead and compute another eigenvector, which is orthogonal to our first component, that describes which direction accounts for the most variance across the space around our first component. And now this process is performed for every dimension in our data. So in this 2D example, we're already done. But now I want to emphasize that it's really important to remember that each principal component is orthogonal to one another. You'll see why this is important in just one second. Now that we have these different principal components, we can transform our data so that instead of it being described in its original dimensions or features, it's now being defined by our different principal components. And now this is really amazing. Since all of our eigenvectors are orthogonal to one another, the relationships and correlations that existed in our pre-transformed matrix are preserved. So we're viewing most of the same data. In this case, we're viewing all the same data, but now just in a new basis. And this is where the real power of dimensionality reduction in PCA comes into play. If we have a higher order matrix, in this case with three dimensions, we can compute just the first two components instead of all three. And then we can just project those two components into two-dimensional space. And this is really powerful. What we've done here is we've taken all of the relationships from our original data, or in this case, most of the relationships of our data, the relationships that have the most variance, and we've clearly projected it into a new space where we can easily see and visualize those different relationships and correlations. Let's see what this looks like from a programming standpoint. So first thing first, we're going to go ahead and import our dependencies and connect to our Atlas cluster. And now we're going to use another UCI machine learning data set. In this case, the data are the results of a chemical analysis of different wine grown in the same region of Italy, but derived from three different cultivators. We'll see what this data looks like in just one moment. So we go ahead and get that collection. And we're going to go ahead and remove the underscore ID field with a project. And then we can go ahead and just marshal our data into a data frame so we can take a peek at it. So here are the 13 fields of our data. And so each one of these measurements is a measurement of a wine from one of three different cultivators. And this alcohol column tells us which cultivator is which. And so these first five documents are all from cultivator one. So we can go ahead and then create a new data frame, X, where we go ahead and remove this column telling us which row is which wine. And then before we dive into PCA, we're going to go ahead and scale our data to remove biases in the different fields. And this is where PCA really begins. I will point out, however, that we're taking the covariance matrix of the transpose of our matrix. And this is because PCA is performed on rows as features, whereas right now our features are columns. So go ahead and calculate that. And now we can go ahead and use NumPy's linear algebra module and go ahead and calculate the eigenvalues and vectors of this covariance matrix. Let's take a peek at what these eigenvalues look like. And here they are. These eigenvalues represent how much variance is accounted for in each respective eigenvector. And so we really want to find which eigenvectors contain the most variance. So we want to go ahead and zip the eigenvalues and vectors together into a variable called eigenmap. And then we can go ahead and sort them by eigenvalue. And now that these two pairs are sorted, we can go ahead and pull them both back out and take a look at these sorted eigenvalues. And you can see they are now clearly sorted in descending order. And now we can go ahead and put the eigenvectors into a data frame and set the columns to the original data frame, obviously minus alcohol. So we can see how the different components of each eigenvector map up to the original features of our data. 
And you can see that we have 12 different eigenvectors for the 12 different dimensions of our data, excluding the one dimension that is which variety each wine is. Now, since these vectors are sorted by their eigenvalues, this means that the top vector up here represents the most variance in our data, and the bottom one the least. And when we look at the absolute values of each of these different terms, we can see how much weight each feature represents. So it looks like flavonoids and non-flavonoid phenols represent the most variance in our data. And now the question is, how many eigenvectors should we keep? Which eigenvectors should we keep to maintain the most amount of data from our original data set? Because that's the whole point of PCA, right? We want to reduce the dimensionality of our data, but we have to figure out how much we want to reduce it to. So to do this, we're going to look at our eigenvalues, and we're going to quantify how much variance each vector represents. So we're going to go ahead and sum all the values up, and then calculate the percentage of the total for each value. And then we'll use the cumulative sum function to progressively add up each of these percentages. And they should obviously add up to 100% at the end. And then real quick, we're going to go ahead and get a variable that tells us how many dimensions we have of our data. This will be useful for a bunch of different plotting functions. And now we can just re very simple go ahead and plot our cumulative sum array. And now we can use this graph to tell us how many principal components we should keep. Each dot here represents the number of the top principal components and how much variance is explained. So with the first three components, we can explain about 67 or so percent of our data. And obviously, with all 12 components, we are going to represent 100 percent of our data. And now the rule of thumb here is called the elbow method. We can see where in this data do we have an elbow? Where in the data do we have diminishing returns after some point? And so our elbow here actually isn't super sharp, but you can see that the first three components explain almost 70% of the variance in our data. And so for the sake of this lesson, to keep it simple, we're just going to go ahead and take the top two, which do account for over 50% of the variance in our data, which is actually pretty good. So we'll go ahead and pull out these first two eigenvectors. Um, so this will be PC1 and PC2. And then we can go ahead and put these two uh, vectors into their own matrix. And here's what this matrix looks like. And so this matrix only has two dimensions to it. We now want to go ahead and apply these two vectors, or this matrix, against our original data set so we can project it in the terms of these two principal components. And to do that, we'll go ahead and just take the dot product of our original matrix, our original set of data, against this new matrix, and we'll call that Y. And then let's go ahead and plot to see what this looks like. And there's actually some pretty cool clustering going on. And we can now s visually see relationships of over 50% of the different data points in our data, but only using two dimensions. Now, in practice, you're not going to do all these steps manually. And that's because scikit-learn can do it for us. Performing PCA is really as simple as just importing the PCA function from sklearn, and then saying how many components you want, and then fitting it. And now when we go ahead and plot this using the output from scikit-learn, You'll see that we get the same graph, but it's just upside down. And now let's see if we can go ahead and apply some machine learning to this transformed data set. So we'll first pull out the alcohol column, split up our data, and here I'm just going to use the logical regression function. And then we'll go ahead and fit our training data. And you can see when we run this machine learning algorithm on our original data set, we get 93% accuracy. But when we do the same thing on our dimensionality reduced one, we get 96. And this is because we've effectively removed the noise in our data with PCA. So we covered a lot of content in this lesson. So let's go ahead and recap what we've learned. We saw how we can use PCA to reduce the dimensionality of our data. And we saw that this is performed by finding the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of our data. And then once we have these vectors, we can go ahead and sort them by their eigenvalue and then keep some number of the top components. And this will allow us to represent the majority of our data with significantly less dimensions. Let's talk about linear regressions. In this lesson, we're going to describe what linear regressions are, discuss some use cases for them. We're also going to look at common methods for performing linear regressions. And then finally, we're going to look at how we can calculate the error when you're performing a linear regression analysis.
Before we dive into what linear regressions are, let's first discuss when you use them. Let's go ahead and imagine that we've collected a set of data where we've collected the height and weight of a bunch of people. And now, given this set of data, we want to predict someone's weight given their height. So what we can do is, is we can plot all these data points on a graph where the y-axis is the weight and the x-axis is the height. And then what we can do is we can see visually that there's a positive correlation in our data. So as one's height increases, so does their weight. Moreover, we can see that this correlation is fairly linear. There is some variance, which is the measure of how far a random value is from its expected mean, but for the most part, this data follows a line. So if we wanted to predict a person's weight, how do we do it? Well, this is where linear regression comes in. We can perform a linear regression on this data to create a line of best fit, and then, given a particular height, the independent variable, we can estimate a predicted weight, the dependent variable, from that independent variable. And now this is pretty awesome, but what's even more awesome is that you can apply linear regressions just like this to any number of independent variables. And so rather than finding a line of best fit, you might be finding a plane of best fit, or even more complex shapes as you move into higher and higher dimensions. Now there are many different methods for performing a linear regression, and there are pros and cons to each method. And we don't have time to sketch each and every one. And if you're curious, I highly recommend that you look at the Wikipedia article linked in the lesson notes to find out more. But in this lesson, we're going to discuss one of the most common methods for performing a linear regression, which is called ordinary least squares. And we're going to go ahead and walk through how this technique actually works. So what this technique does is it calculates the distance between a predicted point on our line and an actual data point. And then we do that for every single point of data that we have. And then once we have all these distances, we then square them. Thus the name least squares. Now you might say, hey, those aren't squares, those are rectangles. And that's because our axes aren't scaled the same way. So if these axes were actually the same, these would be nice little green squares instead of green rectangles. Anyway, back to the method. It's called least squares because we're trying to find a line of best fit that minimizes the sum of all of these areas. And that's pretty much how ordinary least squares works. But now it's really important to point out that linear regression isn't great for all types of data. Say that we have data that tracks the temperature every hour of the day for a certain geographic location. If we were to apply a linear regression to this data, we can totally get a line of best fit. But as you can see, this line of best fit doesn't really fit this data very well. And while we could find a prediction of temperature given an hour in the day, we can see that it's not going to be very effective. And that's because linear regressions work on data with linear correlations. Sometimes determining this is pretty obvious, like in this visualization, where you can pretty clearly see that there's a linear correlation. But especially when you have many different independent variables that you're trying to do a linear regression on, it's not going to be quite this easy. And that's why we need to calculate error. And again, there are many different ways to calculate error for a line of best fit or a plane of best fit, what have you. But we're going to talk about one of the most common, which is called mean squared error. And this is actually very tightly related to our least squares method for how we determined our line of best fit. Similarly, how this method works is that we calculate the difference between a predicted value on the line and an actual value. And again, we then square those differences, which are called residuals. And then we take all these different squares and we average those together. And that's the mean squared error. And so we can use this single value as a value for our error for this line of best fit for this set of data. So now let's talk about what we learned in this lesson. We saw what linear regressions are at a very high level. We saw a very basic use case for them. We saw a big list of different methods for calculating linear regression. And we walked through one of the most common ones, which was the least squares method. And then finally, we saw how it's important that 
you use a linear regression on data with a linear correlation, and how you can use error calculation using mean squared error to verify that your line best fit actually is fitting your data properly. In this lesson, we're going to see how MongoDB fits into a linear regression or just a overall general data science workflow. Specifically, we're going to see how MongoDB's aggregation framework is very useful when performing linear regression or other types of analyses on large or unstructured data sets. And then specifically, we're going to look at how we can do a practical example of using scikit-learn to do a linear regression on some data stored in MongoDB. So there are many different types of data analysis that can be formed directly in MongoDB using its powerful aggregation framework. However, linear regression currently is not one of these types of analyses. There are other tools like scikit-learn that are much better suited for supporting this type of analysis. So why are we talking about MongoDB when we're trying to talk about linear regression? Well, the reason is, is that there are several reasons why you'd want to use MongoDB in your data analysis workflow alongside more traditional data science tools like Python and scikit-learn. So the first reason is you might have a large volume of data that you need to analyze. So when you have large volumes of data, data sizes that are generally require more than one computational unit to store and process data, then you need to sample your data in some way because you don't have enough computing resources to run a linear regression on that one single machine for that large volume of data that you have. Moreover, you might have some type of unstructured data that needs to be transformed to perform some type of analysis. Or your data just might already live in MongoDB. These are all reasons why you'd want to leverage MongoDB's powerful aggregation framework to pull data out of MongoDB, clean it, transform it, process large amounts of data, and then pipe that information into something like scikit-learn, where you can then do your type of machine learning analysis. This is going to be a much more efficient way to manage large types of unstructured data than trying to transform and clean that data in a traditional programming language with something like Python. Moreover, once you have performed that analysis, it's very easy for you to then store your results in MongoDB for easy retrieval later down the road. But enough with words and diagrams, let's actually see this in action. So here we're going to take a look at the 100Y weather small data set. And this is a collection of weather data collected by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Organization here in the United States. And we're going to use MongoDB Compass to visualize the distribution of our data. And as you can see here, there are a whole bunch of different data points in each document. But we're going to focus on three. We're going to focus on air temperature. We're going to focus on dew point. And finally, we're going to look at pressure. And when you look at the distribution of the value field, the embedded value field for each of these top level fields, you can see that we have these serious outliers over here. We have outliers for pressure in the 9,000s. We have outliers for dew point in the 900s. And we have outliers for air temperature also in the 900s. And this is how NOAA signifies erroneous data. So we're going to need to go ahead and filter these values out before we perform our linear analysis. And then we're going to go ahead and perform that linear regression and see if we can predict air temperature given dew point and pressure. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So here I've gone ahead and already set up the imports that I need. We're going to go ahead and connect to our MongoDB Atlas cluster. And then finally we're going to go ahead and connect to this 100Y small database and the data collection which has this NOAA data set. And like I was saying earlier, we want to go ahead and filter out those outliers. We want to filter out those erroneous values. And so for air temperature.value, we're going to say less than 900. Dew point.value, less than 900. And pressure.value, we're going to say less than 9,000. Because this pressure is being measured in hectopascals, which are frequently measured well above 1,000. So we can go ahead and create our filter. We also want to go ahead and do a projection so we can remove our underscore ID and just keep these three fields. So we'll go ahead and do that. We also want to filter this data. So there's tons of different data points in this collection, but we really only want to like do a small sample. So we're going to do 10,000 documents. And with the sample command, we'll get a random selection. So we now have all of our different stages, and we can go ahead and pass th these stages to the db.aggregate command and get our cursor. 
And then we're going to go ahead and exhaust this cursor by wrapping it with list and storing this list in this weather data variable. Great. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of these example documents. And as you can see, we now have the three fields we care about, temperature, dew point, and pressure. And we have the three values that correspond to those fields. Now that we know that our data looks like the way that we want, we can go ahead and use the json.normalize function from pandas to go ahead and marshal this into a data frame. Now that's in a data frame, let's go ahead and make sure our data frame looks the way we want. And there we go. Pandas went ahead and created three different columns with all different values for the three different dimensions. Now I'm going to go ahead and enable the matplotlib inline function so that Seaborn is able to display its graphs. And here I'm using the pair plot function on our data frame to go ahead and create pairwise comparisons against every variable. And we can go ahead and visualize that right here. So as you can see, we have air temperature, dew point, and pressure. And then we have air temperature, dew point, and pressure. So when we look at these pair plots, we can see that dew point and air temperature have a pretty good linear correlation. And you can see the same chart again right here. And pressure and air temperature also have some interesting clustering, but I wouldn't say it's very linear in nature. Now that we know that there's a good correlation between dew point and air temperature, let's go ahead and drop out air temperature and create a data frame that just has dew point and pressure. And then we want to create another data frame that just has air temperature. And this is because we want to basically try and predict air temperature given a dew point and a pressure. We can then go ahead and create an object for our linear regression using the ordinary least squares model from scikit-learn. We're then going to go ahead and split up our data frames so that we have both a training set and a test set with our test set only comprising 20% of our data. And then it's as simple as doing reg.fit. We just do the fit method on our linear regression object. And it's really that easy. We can now go ahead and actually look at the line of best fit here. We can look at the coefficients for our terms. So this first term represents our dew point. And so as you can see, it has a very large coefficient. It's very close to one. And that's because as we saw earlier, dew point has a high correlation, a linear correlation to air temperature. Whereas pressure, um, it still has a small component, but not nearly the same component that dew point has, which is what we observed earlier. We can also look at the intercept for our equation, which is you know negative 24. That doesn't really matter as much, but I just wanted to show you that you have access to both these underlying variables. And then we can go ahead and predict using our, our test data set and kind of compute some test temperatures. But since we know the actual air temperatures for these pairs of dew points and um, pressures that we're predicting here, we can go ahead and just subtract them using NumPy math and uh, square them and then take the mean of all those squares. And this right here will be our mean squared error. And so when we look at this, we can see six degrees, which means on average, given a dew point and pressure, will be plus or minus six degrees from the actual air temperature, which is not too bad. This value by itself isn't super useful, but where it really might be helpful when you want to compare this linear model against some other maybe more complex model. So let's go ahead and recap what we've learned. We've discussed some different reasons for why you'd use the aggregation framework with MongoDB alongside your current data analysis workflow. And then moreover, we've gone ahead and seen how to actually perform a very basic linear regression analysis using scikit-learn from data that's actually stored directly in MongoDB. In this lesson, we're going to discuss decision trees. Decision trees are a type of supervised learning algorithm most commonly associated with classification, but they can be used for regression as well. They are capable of accepting both continuous and categorical data. Internally, they form a tree-like structure with different nodes corresponding to different features. Here is a fictional sample of a data set containing 10 samples from an officer's speeding stops. She always patrols the same stretch of highway where the speed is 90 kilometers per hour or 55 miles per hour. Looking at this, we might start to derive rules by analyzing the impact each feature has on the outcome. For example, does the good weather feature impact whether someone got a ticket? How about the speed? Is there a threshold? 
Internally, decision trees are if-else structures. Here we see a decision tree for the previous data set. Root and branch nodes represent decisions based on some value in the data, and leaf nodes represent an output. The first rule the machine found is regarding speed. If it's less than or equal to 62.5, there are other factors involved on whether a ticket was issued. If over, a ticket was issued. The next thing it checks is fought with spouse. If less than or equal to 0.5, then a ticket wasn't issued. Otherwise, it was issued. Of course, fought with spouse was categorical, either 0 or 1, but the rule works. The guinea value that you see is the score of the internal cost function of that node. 0 0.5 is the worst for a two-class classification tree, meaning there was an even split with two class outputs. And 0 is the best, meaning that it only output one class. So it was a leaf node. The tree internally evaluates features and potential splits with this cost function over and over until it reaches a state in which each input will flow to a terminal leaf node. Keep in mind, however, that oftentimes decision trees aren't 100% accurate. This is an engineered example, so we won't worry too much about this, and fully understanding the mathematics isn't necessary to use the power of decision trees. Now that you have an idea of what decision trees are and how they work, let's dive in. As usual, we'll start by ensuring we have the necessary libraries installed and imported. Then, we'll set up PyMongo. For the lesson, we'll be connecting to the Class Atlas cluster. A link to the dataset in JSON format is included in the comment, or you may navigate to the UCI Machine Learning Repository to download the original dataset. This dataset consists of various measurements taken by radio telescopes. It contains eight continuous features and one class, whether it is a pulsar or not. Okay, let's look at the data. As we can see, there are nine data points, eight continuous features, and one class label. Let's use the describe method to get an idea of the data distribution. So it looks like we have some good distributions of data for a lot of features and not so much for a few others. For example, looking at the skew DMSNR feature here, we see a mean of 104.86 and a standard deviation of 106.51 with a max of 1191. That max is about 11 standard deviations from the mean. So let's look at a distribution plot of that to get a visual indication. Here, I've extracted that data from the SKU DMSNR columns into two variables, one where it was a pulsar and one where it isn't. Then I'm going to overlay a plot with them so we can see their distributions. And we have a pretty neat visualization. Red is the distribution for pulsars, and blue is the distribution for not pulsars. As we can see by this long tail, this distribution may cause us problems. Next, let's use the Seaborn pair grid to visualize all the features. We'll specify the features to plot in the vars arguments and specify the hue in the hue argument, where we specify the hue as the class. And here we see our pair grid where different features are plotted against each other by hue. We can see a clear separation on some of the features and a big overlap on some of the other features. We have a pretty good idea of how our features look like compared against each other, but how do they correlate to whether something is a pulsar or not? For that, we use a correlation matrix. This function here, taken from sklearns documentation, will help us view a correlation matrix in an easier to understand manner. And here, with my mouse over the pulsar column, I can see how the other features correlate against whether something is a pulsar. It looks like EXCUR IP has a strong positive correlation, whereas mean IP has a strong negative correlation. So now that we have a good understanding of how our data correlates and what it looks like, let's train a decision tree classifier. As usual, we'll start by splitting our data into a training and testing set, calling the decision tree classifier method and assigning it to a CLF variable, 
and then fitting that variable with our training data. Now let's get predictions from our model and then we'll look at it in a confusion matrix to see how well that model did. Again, this function here is taken almost verbatim from sklearn's documentation. It's only changed a little bit to improve the formatting. We'll also output a classification report that'll help us judge how well our model did. Okay, and we can see we have average scores and precision of 0.97, recall of 0.97, and F1 score of 0.97. This seems pretty good. However, let's take a closer look at what that means. To do that, we'll look at the confusion matrix. The columns of the confusion matrix are the predicted labels, and the rows are the actual labels. So, the top left is true negatives, which means it wasn't a pulsar in this case. The bottom left is false negatives, where it was a pulsar but was predicted to not be. The top right is false positives, where it wasn't a pulsar but was predicted to be. And the bottom right is true positives, where it was a pulsar and was predicted to be a pulsar. Knowing what the confusion matrix represents, let's take a look at our classification report again. Are we really getting 97% accuracy in precision, recall, and F1 score? Technically, we are, but it's kind of trash. Let's look at support, which is the occurrence of each class within the testing data. We had 5,370 samples to test. Of those, 504 supplied were a pulsar, 4,866 were not a pulsar. So if we divide 4,866 by the total, we get 90% accuracy. Let's discuss what precision, recall, and F1 score are. Precision is a metric that gives us information about the performance of our model in terms of how well it predicts true positives compared to false positives. The better the precision, the more picky our model is. So if we have a cutting edge treatment for some catastrophic disease, but the side effects are severe, we'd want very high precision in diagnosing the disease. Recall deals with the negatives. It gives us performance information on a model in terms of how well it predicts true positives compared to false negatives. The better the recall, the more general our model is. If that same catastrophic disease is spreading and we're in charge of quarantine, we might want a model with high recall. More people will be placed in quarantine and have to be screened. Maybe they had a sniffle or a cough, but better than missing someone. The F1 score is a combined score of both precision and recall, and is a harmonic mean of the two. Let's reinforce this with a slightly different example. Imagine we are an evil power programming a model to catch a particular pair of hobbits traveling with an item that is our only true weakness. In this scenario, we'd want a model with higher recall than precision we'd get less false negatives at the expense of more false positives, meaning we'd capture and imprison more hobbits and perhaps anything that looked like a hobbit. Not all may carry the one ring, but we'll most likely catch the ones that do. Now, imagine we have a model that determines whether to buy a stock or not. A model with a higher precision than recall may miss some stocks that were worth buying, but the ones it does buy will be good, meaning it is less likely to gamble with our hard-earned money. Back to our Pulsar's model. We can see that our model is more general than it is picky. In its role for predicting whether something is a Pulsar or not, it is more likely to incorrectly label an object as not a Pulsar, when it was one, than it is to dismiss the object. In all honesty though, our current model has both poor precision and recall for determining whether something is a pulsar. We should expect that our model could get 90% accuracy just by labeling everything as not a pulsar. Let's look at our support column. We can see that out of 5,370 test samples, 4,866 were not a pulsar. If we divide 4,866 divided by 5,370, 
we can see we'd expect a 90 to 91 percent accuracy rating. I wouldn't be happy putting this model to work. Is there anything else we can do to improve? Well, we can try and scale our data. Decision trees are much more resilient to non-standardized data, but scaling may help a little. Let's scale the data to see if we get any improvements. Here I'll make a copy of all my features so that I can scale them without disturbing the original. I'll use the standard scaler from sklearn, and then fit and transform my features, then train a new decision tree classifier with those scaled features. Now let's look at the results. It looks like the results are negligible, and depending on your run and how the algorithm worked for you, they could in fact be worse. Let's try something else. Let's try a random forest classifier. A random forest classifier is an ensemble method, meaning it combines output from many models to produce a better model. It uses many decision trees and averages their best parameters. Using it is as easy as assigning this to a variable and fitting it to the data. I've chosen a value of 100 for n estimators here based on testing and playing around with the data previous to this lesson. This is the number of decision trees the forest will consist of. Now that I've trained it and used it to predict, let's see the results. These are much better results. Our precision has increased by over 10%, and our recall went up as well. At this point, we might want to go back to the source data itself to clean it more, see if we can eliminate features, or to create new features from existing ones, otherwise known as engineered features. One thing of note with decision trees in random forests is that we can ask the computer what relevancy it assigned our features. Pretty neat. And these map very closely according to the absolute value of their correlation coefficients we looked at earlier in the correlation matrix. We've covered a lot of information in this lesson, so let's discuss what you've learned. You've learned how decision trees work at a high level. How to use a simple decision tree model from scikit-learn. You've learned what precision, recall, and F1 score are, and why you may prefer higher results in one category over another and how to use a random forest classifier for better results. One of the cool things about pandas is the describe method. We can use it to get the distribution of values within a data frame. One of the downsides of that is that we need to fetch all of the data from the database in order to calculate that information on the client, and that can be really slow. Here, I present to you a way to do it entirely with an aggregation. First, we have this remove underscore ID variable, which is just a project stage that removes the underscore ID. Next, we have the find keys variable, which is a group stage that converts every document it comes across to its current keys and then groups on that collection of keys. And then we have merge keys, which is a project stage that does just that. It uses reduce to go over the return from this group and flattens the list where we only end up getting back a unique list of keys encountered in our documents. Stats by key is where most of the magic happens. We have the stats helper function that really just cleans up data for us. Down here, we have one of the fastest we're going to use, which is a bucket auto stage followed by a group stage. This gives us our percentile information as well as some minimum maximum information. Then, in another facet, we're going to use a group stage where we get our count, our standard deviation, and the mean. Here is where it's all combined together. You can see where we return the count, mean, standard deviation, minimum, 25th percentile, 50th, 75th, and max. Let's see how all this looks when we run it. And here you see an idea of the aggregation pipeline that those two functions above give us. Now, I'm not going to scroll down through this, but I can promise you it is very long. Here's the information that it gives us. It looks a lot like the pandas describe method. And here is the panda describe method so that you can compare the two. This is a pretty cool feature. 
in this lesson, we're going to discuss clustering algorithms. And so we're going to cover how they work at a high level. And then we're going to explore scikit-learn's k-means clustering algorithm. And we'll talk about how we can pre-process data to obtain better results. At a basic level, clustering involves calculating distances and moving points, which we call centroids. In this image, the centroids are the green dots, which are initially placed randomly. And the distance from each centroid to each point is calculated, and then the points nearest the centroids are assigned to that centroid. So once all the distances have been calculated, the centroids then move to the center of all of those combined distances, therefore minimizing each of those distances. And then this process is repeated until the centroids do not move and no points have been assigned to a new centroid. We'll be using k-means from scikit-learn for clustering in this lesson. And one important thing to note is that k-means only works with numerical data. And that's because we can't calculate Euclidean distances on non-numerical data. And so that means we're going to have to do some pre-processing. So let's go ahead and see what that processing looks like in our notebook. So first, we're going to make sure we have the, our necessary dependencies imported. And then we're going to go ahead and connect to our MongoDB Atlas cluster. So we're going to use the UCI machine learning repo again. And here we're going to use the Pulsars dataset, which um, is a dataset containing various measurements taken by radio telescopes. We'll see in a bit, but it contains eight continuous features and one class, which is whether or not it is a Pulsar. So here we're just going to execute a simple find command for everything projecting away the underscore ID since it's not actually a part of the original data set. And then we're going to go ahead and marshal that into a data frame and take a peek of our data. And here you can see that there are nine columns, eight of which are features, and one of which is the class. And you can see that this data is on a variety of different scales. Let's go ahead and use Seaborn to look at a pair plot of our data. And this is pretty interesting. We can see some pretty good groupings and some good clusters. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at the correlation matrix. So we're first going to go ahead and remove the label from our data frame, and then go ahead and create a correlation matrix. And here's a nice little helper to make the correlation matrix a lot prettier. And looking at the label column, we can see that there's a strong correlation between a label and exkurt IP, as well as between the label and uh, skew IP. And so if we use just these two features alone, we would expect an accuracy within about the 70th percentile for predicting whether or not an object is a pulsar. So let's go ahead and perform the initial clustering. But before doing that, we want to determine how many clusters we want. So for this, we're going to create an elbow plot. And so we already know that we need two clusters because it's either going to be a pulsar or not a pulsar. And this data basically backs this up. You can see that at two, we have the most sharp increase. And then we have some pretty serious diminishing returns. But if we didn't know how many clusters we needed, th we could use this and we could see where the elbow is in our, in our plot. We can figure out how many clusters we want to aim for. Before running the algorithm, we're going to go ahead and split our data into a training and test set. And it's pretty straightforward to go ahead and run the algorithm from sklearn. I do want to point out, since we're not passing in the labels, this is unsupervised learning. So I'll go ahead and execute that. And so in this last cell here, we're computing a confusion matrix. And in this cell, we are going to go ahead and make the output very pretty. And this is one of the greatest parts about sklearn, is that the documentation is very, very good. And I was able to just go ahead and copy and paste this function directly from the documentation. And now we can go ahead and take a look at our confusion matrix. And you can see that we do a very good job of determining when it's not a pulsar. But we don't do such a great job when we're trying to classify it as a pulsar. And so you can see here that we actually are in the 70th percentile for accuracy as we kind of expected. But this is really just because we're labeling things as not a pulsar. And our data shows that most things are not a pulsar. And so given the size and the numbers of the actual pulsars, we should expect about 70% accuracy just if we just labeled everything as not a pulsar. So how can we improve this? Well, one of the things that we can do is scale our data. The input sizes we are currently dealing with vary greatly. And when we look at the output of describe, this is pretty clear. We can see that we have a, quite the range of max values for each of these different features. And so one of the things that we can do is scale our data. And we can look at the distributions before and after. And before, you can see that we have things all over the place. And after, you can see that things are much more around the same uh, values. Let's make sure we didn't destroy any data. And when we look, we can see that our correlations are the same. Now let's look at another elbow plot. 
with our scaled data. And you can see that our elbow is a little bit more pronounced now. And again, we're asked to find only two clusters. That's where the elbow is, is the most visible. And now when we run the same algorithm again, you can see that we have a pretty sizable improvement, almost a 20% improvement actually. And looking at the confusion matrix, we can see that we're doing a much better job of classifying whether something is a pulsar. And so our precision and recall scores have gone up considerably. But the question is, can we do even better? So here we can try to use principal component analysis, which will allow us to reduce the dimensionality of our problem set. Let's see if applying this transformation will help us eke out better results. First, we'll apply PCA, allowing us to reduce our data down to just two dimensions. And now when we look at this elbow plot, we can see a very sharp elbow. And when we go through the same algorithm again, and now we can see a marked difference with a 97% accuracy. And so we're doing an even better job of classifying things as not pulsar and pulsar. And you can actually see the actual clusters reflect this. Here's predicted, and you can see the two clusters. But in reality, we can see that some of these points bleed over into the other plot, which is why we had those uh, misgivings. Let's recap what we covered. We saw how clustering works at a high level, and we saw how to quickly use k-means algorithm from sklearn. Moreover, we saw how we can apply this many times with different amounts of clusters if you're unsure how many clusters you need. And so you can plot those results in an elbow plot. We saw the importance of normalizing and scaling our data in order for this algorithm to be effective. And we saw how we could make these results even better by applying other algorithms like PCA.